There I am. And I'm live. Let's just move this a bit closer. So, hello everyone who is on here, currently one person, but I'm sure more will join me shortly. Um, for those who haven't seen anything of mine before, um, I mainly do sleep meditations, but being autistic for Autism Awareness Week, I'm doing autism videos, uh, hello, greetings, uh, autism videos a week. Around that, because of many people being isolated, etc., I'm uh, doing videos anyway, most nights if I can, to try and be helpful. Uh, and Monday nights, obviously, are the normal kind of Monday night thing, the sleep meditation thing. Uh, feel free to give thumbs up if you end up finding this interesting or helpful in any way. And feel free to subscribe if you're not subscribed and you think, oh, I'd quite like to subscribe to this person's channel. Um, I'm just sorting my phone out so that it doesn't go off. Put that over there. Everything's been a bit rushed this evening, but I am here now. Um, and I've just lost my page. Now I found my page, I think. Just making sure I'm trying to find where I am. Um, oh yeah, that's what I was doing. So, <laughs> um, I'll just tilt that a bit. So today I will be reading some of my book, Look Into My Eyes my autobiography. Uh, many of you who have been here till, up till now will obviously uh, have heard me say that every day, so you'll already know that. Um, it's available in ebook. It's available... Uh, <laughs> I doubt I did. It was in a tweet um, using limited Twitter numbers. Um, yeah, so... Uh, my book's available, obviously, in paperback and as an ebook, and um, yeah. So, if anyone ends up wanting to know more than what I read here, feel free to check it out. Uh, the structure of this will probably be similarish to before. I will read a chunk and then check out what sort of things you've said in the live chat. Try and respond to any questions. Hopefully, using what I say as kind of a, um, a springboard into discussions about stuff. Um, the idea was a very good idea to read some of my book, but in my head, part of it was also that then it does help to focus these a bit more. Rather, What I was going to do initially for Autism Awareness Week was kind of try and come up with a topic every night or every day and then just talk about those topics. But it does make a lot more sense to base those topics on bits from the book. So we've covered um, lockdown, uh, we've covered being a child, being a teen, and now we're still in the being a teen stage, but it's about um, kind of around the time where I started learning to actually have some level of uh, social skill type stuff. Uh, so that's where I'm at now. Um, the section in the book is Conjuring Up Calm and Wonder. Uh, what you'll probably notice is in my book, lots of the subheadings seem to be magic related. Don't know why, just turned out that way. So, yeah, it helps to keep things on topic a little bit more. Uh, so the first one that I did, I wrote down a bunch of notes, kind of... Uh, scribbling down some of the ideas of thinking um what are some of the bits that impact on social isolation etc um and then what are some of the bits that impact on me in certain ways what are some of the strengths by being me and um what are some of the challenges and what are some of the challenges others might have who aren't me but are in different circumstances so that kind of for the first hour on the first one of these kept it on track for that first hour but then it kind of veered off 
to people asking about anxiety and stuff like that. And so it veered off into anxiety and other areas, which are equally as helpful, hopefully, uh, to the people who are asking the questions. Um, but it wasn't as on track as something like this is, um, I think, where I can get to read a chunk of a book and keep coming back to it to try and keep it on that type of area. So thanks for the privilege of listening to this. Uh, so I will read this section. Um, I'm always aware I'm attempting to, re if I sort of ever look awkward here, I'm trying to kind of put the book in a position where it's not like in front of my face or something, but it doesn't hit uh, my laptop, which isn't that far away from me. Um, but that I'm not talking facing entirely down. So um, it's trying to get that balance between having the book somewhere I can read it and not just feeling like I'm staring down the whole time. Um, so through my teens, I remained interested in nature, specifically being out in the woods or by the sea. I was also very interested in sea creatures, especially sharks, whales and dolphins. I liked other sea creatures, but these were my main focus. As a teenager, I was becoming increasingly interested in swimming and being underwater. I liked being like I liked being like creatures that lived underwater. I started to buy video documentaries on sharks, whales and dolphins. I tried to design a device that would read the brainwave activities of dolphins as they interacted with different images of items and their behaviours. My thinking was that their brainwaves could be recorded when they approached symbols for food, etc. And then maybe scientists could begin to create a way of communicating with them. I thought if brainwaves and behaviour were monitored enough, then perhaps scientists would be able to start linking the brainwave pattern with specific behaviours that they saw uh, taking place at the same time. And perhaps with specific whistles they used, then maybe an underwater synthesizer could be used to communicate back. I didn't know whether this was possible, but it was an idea I had, and so I submitted it to BBC's Tomorrow's World programme. I was also interested in the giant squid and the fact that it had never been seen alive. Obviously it has now. I couldn't understand how it could never have been seen alive when sperm whales could find and eat them frequently. I'd seen a documentary where a camera was harpooned into the back of a great white shark and couldn't see why scientists couldn't just harpoon some camera designed to withstand deep water, perhaps with air tanks attached which would inflate pouches to raise them back to the surface after it detached from the whale's back. And red lights to light up the area in front of the whale. My view was that the whale would find the giant squid and the cameras would film what happened. It may not have produced the best footage, but it would have at least produced footage of some live giant squids. For a large part of my teenage years, I was part of Dolphin Watch. I used to go out on the beach every day and sit in my grandparents' beach hut, looking out over the sea for signs of dolphins swimming in the channel. The idea was that any dolphins I saw, I'd report where I saw them, at what time and in what direction they were swimming. I used to sit on my own for hours with a telescope and binoculars, just watching the sea. One day, one of my brothers joined me. I don't think he was so interested in what we were doing, but this day we got lucky. I saw a fin. Unfortunately, it wasn't a dolphin's fin. I was able to tell that straight away. It was a shark's fin. I shouted to my brother, come on, come on, quick, quick. I grabbed the small dinghy we had and ran down towards the water. My brother ran after me, unsure as to what I'd seen. He kept asking me, what is it? What is it? I was too busy running to be to the sea to bother to answer him, though. We jumped into the dinghy and both started to paddle out. I didn't want to take my eyes off the fin in case I lost where I saw it. After we'd paddled out a little way, my brother still wanted to know what we were doing. Perhaps he thought I'd seen a dolphin. I told him, there's a shark. I'm just trying to get to it. Next second, he jumped out of the dinghy and waded quickly back to shore as if what we were doing was a bad idea. Annoyingly, by the time I got out into deeper water, the shark had lowered completely under the water and I couldn't work out where it had gone. Almost every year during my teens, I went to Brighton Sea Life Centre, and for one year, my grandparents got me a yearly membership, which meant I visited very frequently. What was better still, I received a magazine and other bits from them. 
I'd read books by people who dived with sea creatures for a living and started to think about whether it was possible to grow up and do that as a job. I wondered what you had to do to be a marine biologist. I thought it must be a good job because you're underwater with the sea life, where it's quiet and peaceful, with no other people around. At worst, maybe just one or two other people. But even then, you wouldn't have to talk with them, and then you'd get to write and analyse what you'd been learning. It sounded like a job I could do, and didn't involve too much interaction with other people. It seemed ideal. All adults I knew who worked seemed to do jobs that involved people. Many jobs seemed to place lots of importance on being able to behave appropriately with people. When we had to do work experience in school, many of the teenagers got work experience in shops, banks or restaurants and other places where I would have fallen to pieces if I'd had to go and do a job there. I don't think I would have lasted a day at that point in my life. I decided I wanted to go scuba diving for my work experience. I'd only recently heard about scuba diving as a term for what these underwater people were doing on the various documentaries. I thought if I wanted to be a marine biologist, I would need to know how to dive. During my work experience, I managed to get to go out on dives and working for a small company, I usually saw just one or two people a day. My days consisted of cleaning scuba gear, making cups of tea, sorting paperwork, learning about the different equipment, and then going out on the dives. I loved the smell of the equipment and the watery smell of cleaning the equipment after a dive. It always smelt so fresh. This was the ideal choice of work experience for me because it had minimal interaction with people other than me approaching them to ask about different equipment and how it worked. They were happy not to approach me. They would set me a task like spending the morning cleaning the diving gear and I'd then go and clean the diving gear without needing supervision. The tasks weren't complicated. They were often things deemed as boring. These are usually the things I like to do because they allow me to be in my own mind and in my own thoughts. The scuba diving company felt I did really well and appeared very keen and knowledgeable. So they offered a discount for me to train with them. Thus, I took my paddy open water diving training. It was one of the best things that I've done. I took the course during late autumn and into early winter. So much of the diving was very cold. The first diving experience was in an indoor heated swimming pool. This was warm and comfortable and allowed us students to get used to the diving equipment and to do all aspects of what we'd have to do to pass the course. We had to dive in a freshwater lake. This was very cold and I think it felt colder than it usually perhaps would have done because we had to change into our scuba gear, uh, scuba gear beside the lake and then walk in and swim out a little way to get into the deeper water. When you drop backwards off a boat, all the water floods into the wetsuit at once and your body warms the water that's now next to your skin. On the other hand, when you walk in from the shore, cold water slowly seeps in, filling the suit more and more with each step. It's always easier to dive straight into a swim pool rather than climb down the stairs into the pool or lowering yourself into water, much like it's easier to run and dive in the sea rather than slowly walking in, then reaching that point where you go up on your tiptoes and breathe in and tense your stomach muscles as a wave approaches. Not only was diving in the lake very cold, but it's also very murky. The bottom of the lake had a thick layer of silt. As we lowered to the bottom, I could feel my legs reach the silt. Uh, silt. It was a strange feeling. The silt felt incredibly soft and my legs just continued to sink deeper and deeper. I remember wondering, uh, wondering as I was lowering down, whether it was possible to lower so far into the silt that I can get stuck and be unable to get back out. It wasn't an anxiety wonder, just a curiosity wonder. The water was an opaque, light, greenish brown colour. I could notice that light was passing through the water and I could see bits floating, but visibility was probably no more than 30 centimetres. In this lake, we had to run through each of the tests we were going to do out to sea. For example, having our air turned off without notice and then having to swim slowly, uh, rise slowly to the surface whilst breathing out the whole time at a speed no faster than the instructor's hand, which was above our heads. 
we couldn't see the hand though as we couldn't see the hand though as the instructor was behind us i had no problem doing any of this i found the whole experience of being underwater deeply relaxing and calming i loved the quiet peacefulness of diving when it came to our main dive out to sea it was a windy day in late October. We left the River Arran in a small, rigid, inflatable boat and travelled five miles out from the shore of Little Hampton before coming to a halt. A line was thrown down, which we followed and were told not to let go of. We were told that there's strong currents out there, and if we let go of the line, even for a split second, we may have moved and be unable to find the line again. We could raise to the surface anywhere. There were three of us doing the diving course, two adults and myself. Both adults were sick before leaving the boat, and once they were in the water. The waves were large and rough. Whenever the boat ended up between waves, you could no longer see the shore. I had no problem with this. One of the two adults really didn't want to dive now. They were scared of the water being too rough and of accidentally letting go of the line. But the instructor calmed them down and they went through with the dive. The instructor warned us about basking sharks, telling us how they swim along with their mouths wide open. They wouldn't harm us on purpose, but if we happened to swim into one, we could easily swim into its open mouth before realising that we had done so. You may wonder how you could be in the water with the world's second largest fish and not see it. Well, when I dropped back off the boat and into the water and started to lower under the water, I found out how that could be possible. Visibility wasn't great. I was only able to see my hand in front of my face if I actually placed it on the face mask, even a centimetre from the mask, and I couldn't make it out. For me, this was great. It was like sensory deprivation. Above the water, it was windy, noisy, there was rain and lots of movement on the boat, and even in the water, just bobbing up and down in the waves. We had to go down 10 metres. As I lowered, it got quieter and calmer. The first thing to go once I went completely underwater was all of the noise. As I could hear, uh, all I could hear was the sound of my breathing and the bubbles rising from me. Then a little further down, the waves changed from something you could feel very clearly moving you each time to just feeling a light pressure on one side of your body. Then there was a moment of no pressure, or perhaps it was a feeling of the pressure no longer increasing and then a releasing of pressure, almost like a pressure now on the other side of my body. Then at the bottom, even this seemed to stop. All I was aware of was peace, floating just above the bottom, on the seat floor, uh, bottom of the sea floor. It, see it took what seemed like no time at all for my body to warm the cold water in the suit to body temperature. So I didn't feel hot or cold. Floating there, it felt like I had no sensory input other than the sound of my breathing. It felt like I was relaxing under the water for ages before it was my turn to have my air turned off. I remember swimming to the surface with no air, just breathing out in one long, continuous breath, rising no faster than the instructor's hand. I could notice the surface getting closer and everything getting lighter. At that moment, I also noticed I was coming to the end of my breath. I only just made it to the surface at the speed I was breathing out before I ran out of air. I was aware that if the surface was half a metre higher, I would have stopped breathing before breaking through. This made me feel that I would want to practice breathing out like this more often, to get used to breathing out over specific distances. The instructor was really impressed with me. He told me how well I did and how natural I seemed to find it all, and that I could easily become a diving instructor. I'd never actually thought of that as a job until this moment. All of a sudden, I thought about the qualification I'd just been through and thought about whether I would have been happy to do all of these uh, and thought about whether I would have been happy to do all of these things. There was only a small group of people taking the course and most of it was underwater. So there wasn't a lot of interaction with people. I thought maybe it was something I could do. The opportunity almost presented itself. Two of my relatives who lived in America were planning on sailing around the world and stopping off in the UK. They were visiting their grandparents over here in the UK when I spoke to them. Mum had told, me, uh, told them about how I'd just learned to dive. And the, instruct, and 
that the instructor felt I could go on to become a diving instructor. They said perhaps I'd be interested in sailing around the world with them, teaching diving and taking people out on dives at different places where we'd stop off. Of course, I was very interested in this. I didn't think about the money, like how much I would earn. I didn't care whether I was going to earn any money or not. My first thought were that there would be costs involved in me being on board. I would need food, etc. So it made sense that I would do something that would earn enough money to cover the costs of being on the boat. They were planning on sailing around the world a couple of years later. So I had time to get all my diving qualifications before they arrived back in the UK to pick me up. Unfortunately, it never happened. A storm hit America where their boat was and damaged it beyond repair. I ended up leaving school and having to work. I never did have the opportunity to complete my diving qualifications. Through the whole of my teens, I loved swimming. I went swimming as often as I could. I loved being in the water, the feeling of the surface of the water against my skin. I'd rest my head in the water so that I could feel the surface tension against the side of my face. Or I'd have my hands slightly out of the water to feel the surface tension against my hands. I loved how my heart rate changed when I fully submerged myself. I used to dive down to the bottom of the swimming pool in Little Hampton and hold onto the bottom rail of the steps sitting on the floor and would just relax. It felt like I could stay underwater for ages without feeling like I was trying hard to hold my breath. I remember thinking I could breathe to some extent underwater to keep myself down longer. Whether this was just placebo or something that actually worked, I don't know. But I'd make all of the motions as if I was breathing normally, except for actually letting air in. I knew that breathing in water was definitely not something I wanted to do. I felt like this satisfied the breathing reflex to some extent, because I was breathing. I also felt that this perhaps circulated and mixed the air more in my lungs, rather than maybe having all the carbon dioxide sinking down to the bottom of my lungs and the oxygen being up in my throat. I've continued to love swimming and being in water through to adulthood and can lose track of time in water. I can get into a bath and think 20 minutes have passed and get out and find that three or four hours have actually elapsed. Even being in a swimming pool itself made me feel relaxed. As a child and teenager, I usually got to go swimming when all other children I usually got to go swimming when all other children were also around. In my later teens and adulthood, I was able to go at times when children and teens weren't around so much. But for most of the time, changing rooms were horrible places. They were noisy and crowded, and the only way to feel slightly free from all that chaos was to get one of the cubicles, but these weren't always free. Besides, if you're going into the pool rather than coming out and changing before going home, the time it would take to get a free cubicle changed and then find a locker meant enduring more of the chaos than just finding a locker, zoning out and focusing on changing as quickly as possible, having arrived at the swimming centre with swimming trunks already on under my clothes. Once out of the changing room, you would enter the hectic, loud, chaotic swimming pool area, where every sound echoes. There's something comforting, I find, in echoes, but when the pool area is too busy, that comforting effect of the echo just isn't enough. The strange thing was, being in this amount of chaos and unpleasantness actually made the feeling of entering the water, putting my ears underwater and closing my eyes, for the first time, even more pleasant, as if somehow the relief or escape from the sights and sounds brought more calm than if I'd walked into a quiet changing room and then into a quiet pool. This is a bit like what I would do with hypnosis for people who struggle to relax. I may suggest they take a moment to tense a body part up as I'd count to three and then let it relax. Then I'd count really slowly and they'd hold the tension, wishing they could just stop and relax. When I'd eventually get to three and they could finally release that tension, they'd relax much deeper than if I were to say, focus on this body part and just let it gently relax. I've always liked solving problems and designing things. I'm not so good at making things. I seem to do all right at construction, but I've never been confident at using tools. 
If I do try something new, like using a tool or trying to make something, I like to do it on my own, privately. I don't like to be seen to do it until I know that I can do it well. I don't have to excel at something to be comfortable doing it in public, but I have to be proficient enough that I think I'm doing at least an average job. As a teenager, a friend and I used to design tree camps and death slides. I used to make secret camps in the sand dunes at the beach. I never thought about these things as being cooperative or working as a team. We would work alongside each other. We would have our tasks and we would get on with what we had to do. I never saw it as playing. I didn't know how to pl how play could uh, how play would come into making tree camps or death slides. The idea of building a tree camp was that it gave us somewhere to go to hang out, and the death slide was a quick way to get to the bottom. I used to like sitting alone in the tree camp. In the winter, it was warmer in the tree camp than just sitting in a tree. It was relaxing to sit in the warmth of the camp, just listening to birds singing and the sound of leaves rustling in the trees and creaking branches as they swayed in the breeze. And when, I, when it rained, you could listen to the rain as it hit the roof of the tree camp and the perspex windows. Unlike many people, I've known, unlike many people I've known over the years, I loved magic. I was fascinated by magic. I knew it was fake. I mean, I knew a car didn't vanish and that it was somehow palmed or moved elsewhere. But this was what impressed me. I wanted to know how the trick was done. Even a simple answer would be interesting because the magician had to do that simple answer under people's noses. My question was always, what did they do to make sure the trick wasn't seen. I attended a school reunion in 2014, and the first thing the first person I saw at the reunion said was, what I remember about you was you are always into weird things. You always carried a magic book on you, and you wanted to talk about magic, and you still seem to be into all that same stuff now. And this is true. I love magic as an adult as much as I ever have. When I was a teenager, I used to try to learn different magic tricks from different magic sets and books on magic. I used to try to design my own tricks. What I struggled with was how to create an atmosphere for the illusion. I could read the steps of how to do a trick in a book. I could then practice those exact steps in front of a mirror and master them. I used to find dexterous processes difficult to master, but with practice I could do most things but I had no showmanship. I'd say what a book told me to say, and like a robot, I would do what I had to do. But when I came to perform tricks in front of family members, they wouldn't be fooled. I couldn't misdirect them. I struggled with timing misdirection. Magic is like music. It's all about the beats and the spaces between the beats. It's about tension and relaxation. Magic was the ideal interest for someone who loved designing things and problem solving. But my view is that you also need to understand social communication. That doesn't mean you need to be good in social communication situations, but you need to understand how to direct attention. You need to value the importance of directing attention and the timing of it. To do this, you need to be able to engage an audience. I wasn't good at engaging an audience because engagement is a two-way communication process. I was often talking at an audience, not engaging with an audience. You can notice this in lessons or lectures you've attended. There are some lectures who, lecturers who are great at engaging the audience. They may be just talking to the audience and not having a two-way dialogue, but they talk to the audience in such a way that you feel involved in their lecture. Other lectures may convey the same information but you find their lectures flat and perhaps difficult to sit through because you feel talked at for the duration of the lecture rather than engaged with. Despite trying, I've never mastered showmanship. I can learn the behaviours, but I'm going through an intentional mental pattern. So if I need everyone to be looking in one place when I palm a card elsewhere, then I need to know exactly what I'm supposed to say or do at that moment as part of the time sequence for that stage in the trick. 
I've continued to be fascinated with magic. I read about magic and watch magic shows, but I don't often try to learn magic tricks anymore. Other than wanting to show my magic uncle what I had learned and putting on magic shows for him, I've never wanted to be a performer. I like doing tricks I've learned in front of people, not to perform as such, but to say, look what I've just learned, isn't it interesting? Many of my relatives are very musical, so I've always been interested in the idea of playing musical instruments. But I seem to find it difficult to learn dexterous actions and to link what goes on intellectually with physical actions. I've always felt what is needed is to get myself out of the way and just let it happen. Oddly, the thing I like most in music are the spaces between notes. When listening to instruments like cellos or violins and other sliding instruments, there's a moment when the movement stops before it slides back the other way. This is the moment I like. I tried to learn many different musical instruments as a teenager. I had guitar lessons, trombone lessons. I used to regularly try to play piano, but I was never able to grasp the instruments. Music teachers said in school reports that I seemed natural with music, but I never felt natural. Now I'm older, I think it was partly in how I was trying to learn and how I was taught. I was always taught having to read sheet music and play what I was reading. Although I can understand sheet music slowly, and if I've been trying to play a piece of music for a while, I can understand it faster, I've never been able to read the music at the speed I can read a book. And I can never link written marks with specific actions that will make certain sounds. The songs I can play on a piano, not very well, but I have remembered how to play them, were taught by someone showing me how to play the tune and then me copying their actions so that I'm learning exactly what I need to do. There were no extra steps, like having to read the music, process this, and then play, that, play the music. I think this is how I learn best, not just with music, but with most physical activities. When I learn, I try to imagine myself being the other person and try to mimic them so that I'm doing exactly the same as them. I usually have to do this slowly at first, but as I get used to it, I can improve. This is one of the difficulties with schools. Frequently, they teach the whole class in the same way. And although nowadays there's more focus on multi-sensory learning and ensuring everyone is able to learn through their preferred modality, I think this is often too simplistic. People may learn best visually, but that doesn't necessarily mean reading or seeing images. It could be watching demonstrations and being free to walk around to get the best angle and then to copy the teacher. The one instrument which I seem to get to naturally get was one which I've only ever played once. But in that one instance, the music teacher asked if I'd had lessons, and that was a drum kit. We only had a chance to play drums once in school in a music lesson, and I definitely didn't have permission to play drums out of school. I remember hitting the drum once to see what each sounded like. And then I just hit the drums to make rhythms. I'd never played drums since that one time over 25 years earlier. But I can possibly understand why I may have gotten better playing the drums than other instruments, because I like rhythms and patterns, and don't like mismatches in rhythms or patterns. I also tap a lot, and as a teenager, I used to tap far more often. I copy rhythms or patterns I hear, like bird sounds, the way people put cutlery on a table, or the pattern of car doors being shut when people exit their car, and patterns in certain phrases that people say. There are some things I can learn best from copying. Other things, meanwhile, I can learn well from reading. I personally rarely learn from enforced discussion, yet many courses will say student discussion and debates are important to learning. As a teenager and still as an adult, I was happier to watch how someone does something, copy them, and be able to ask that expert questions if there are some things I didn't understand, or if there was more I felt I needed to know. For more academic subjects, meanwhile, I'd learn best from reading and then talking about what I'd learned with others, or more specifically, at others. I like others asking me questions, but it has to be all about stimulating my thinking further. I struggle with enforced discussions, like, how does this relate to you? 
Discuss what you think the implications are to the field of whatever it happens to be. Discuss how you feel about or discuss your understanding of. Any of these rigid discussion topics would have me closing down straight away. I'd be unable to link these questions with what I was learning. Sometimes starting a very general discussion with me, however, asking me perhaps what have I been learning about, uh, about a subject is likely to be able to lead me to answer some of the questions by starting general and gradually becoming more specific. This normally comes from a one-to-one -one talk with someone, not a group discussion. I'd have nothing to prove to anyone about what I know or don't know. So in discussion groups, I was unlikely to contribute anything. I'd be listening and picking up on anything that interested me as an additional as additional knowledge. But I never felt any compulsion to contribute. I didn't care if I disagreed with what people were saying. I didn't feel a need to express that, as it was of no interest to me what others believed. I was always more of an observer than a participant. Right, I'm going to stop there a minute because now I'm on to the bit that transformed my life. The sentence starts with the event that transformed my life. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But I just wanted to get to that point before stopping. Let me scroll up, see what I've missed over here. Let's have a look. Da, 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 da. Yeah, minimum interaction with people is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, people just suddenly sneak in. I can't help it. Um, you can't really say deeper and deeper without saying deeper and deeper. It just instantly happens. Um, it's one of those times, as Abby often points out to me, where I instinctively do hypnosis entirely, you know, hypnotic stuff entirely without meaning to. The same, I was worried as I was reading, did I actually write counting down into this or have I just said that I about the counting down? I was worried I was going to end up sort of going three, two, one, or something like that. Um, yeah, I would highly recommend people take up scuba diving. Um, and if you can handle dropping into freezing cold water, then feel free to do it in freezing cold water. But if not, wait until it's nicer weather. Nothing wrong with going slow and stopping. Unless you're being chased by a shark or other big creature that might want to eat you. Sharks don't generally obviously want to eat people. Obviously, note to self, if I'm in water and likely to be chased by something that might want to eat me, make sure I'm in the water with you. Uh, I've always wanted to go into a sensory deprivation tank. I think that would be really cool. Um, if I had room at home, I'm sure I would have fitted one by now. Although I'm always reminded of the Simpsons episode, and I strongly suspect that the experience of being in a sensory deprivation tank isn't as fun as the Simpsons episode makes it out to be where Homer and Lisa go into sensory deprivation tanks. Well, 
Not much of a cliffhanger. Maybe a ledge or something. Yes, I had two, um, uh, still got the same two relatives. I had two relatives who lived in Florida who had a big yacht thing that they were going to sail around the world in. And then uh, one day that yacht ended up somewhere inland. Um, it kind of moved itself from the coast to inland and wasn't in one perfect piece. And my family are by no, uh, definitely, definitely not wealthy in the slightest. And so um, they've never been able to kind of be in a position to do the same kind of thing again. And I think both the brothers have ended up moving on to different things with one staying in Florida um, by the sea, loving the sea, and one thinking, I'm going to move away from here. And I think they moved back to Minneapolis or something, um, something like that. Yeah, you don't want any popping knees. <laughs> exactly. You just have to be faster than whoever you're with. Yeah, I found it odd that a number of people I've sort of met over the years have said a similar thing about um, struggling with the breathing when scuba diving. Um, see, I actually find it harder to breathe snorkeling because it feels so much harder work to force that air in and out of a snorkel um, when your head's underwater. Um, and I'm always paranoid that I'm going to get so drawn in to whatever I'm looking down at or focusing on underwater that I'll accidentally swim, putting my head too far under the water that the snorkel is now under the water, just at the point I think that that's a good idea to breathe in. But scuba diving I find uh, fine. I think that's, uh, I don't know, I think because it just seems to match how I breathe. Um, so I never found, I don't remember ever finding it like, um, something difficult. It just felt perfectly natural. Like it was a part of my skin almost. Um, yeah, the Simpsons theme should play all the time that and maybe Bob's burgers theme as well. But yeah, so I definitely think, because snorkel's obviously are perfectly fine to breathe through when you're above land. Like, if I was in here and I stuck a snorkel in my mouth, I could breathe perfectly fine. But I think if, um, maybe because of the fact you've got some water pressure around part of the snorkel tube or whatever, it just suddenly feels, uh, yeah, Bob's Burgers is brilliant. Um, and I want them to do, there was um, the Simpsons intro with Bob's Burgers, where Homer's inside the restaurant, and it's done of obviously exactly what you'd see from Homer's perspective. So the the restaurant's on fire on the inside, and Homer's panicking with all the fire and everything. Uh, and I've always wanted an outside version that I'd love to see a Bob's Burgers episode where, in the background, you can see Homer running around the restaurant. Um, but yeah, I like Bob's Burgers. Um, I'm not so worried about flies flying into the snorkel because that fly has to have flown a long way off of the land to get over to the snorkel. Um, I'm more worried about a seagull kind of pooping down it or something. Uh, mainly worried about the water going in it.
but none of them are huge worries. They're just uh, things I worry about far more than a fly. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, I'd agree about Bob's Burgers. So, let me get back to this. The event that transformed my life. The event that transformed my life happened in 1993. The ITV television channel aired a program called The Hypnotic World of Paul McKenna. The show was essentially a televised version of stage hypnosis. I'd never seen hypnosis before, and watching the show, I didn't really understand what it was. Paul would say that he couldn't show the actual hypnotic induction on TV, but all these people on stage were hypnotized. It appeared that all the people on the show did exactly as he asked them to do. When people did some of the things they were asked to do, like being asked to become astronauts, they seem to take on what they're asked to do as if that, that was really as if that was real to them. I remember wondering whether this hypnosis thing would be able to make people learn different skills by becoming people with those skills. I didn't know how it worked. I'd never seen hypnosis before and had still never seen how to hypnotize someone. Another aspect that interested me was that these people seemed to do whatever Paul asked them to do. It looked like he somehow had control over them. To me, as a teenager, I started thinking that this was something I needed to learn. I wanted to learn how to hypnotise teachers and other children in school to get them to do what I wanted them to do. I thought about what it must be like to walk into a classroom and hypnotise everyone in the room so that they were all quiet and so that the teachers would teach what I wanted to know about without having to move on with what they were supposed to be teaching and without other children in the class interrupting or being annoying while I was trying to learn what I wanted to learn. I thought hypnosis might be the ultimate way of controlling the world around me, so that people left me alone when I wanted to be alone, and so that I didn't have to do things I didn't want to do. If a teacher asked me to do something I didn't want to do, say I'd be able to hypnotise them and tell them they wouldn't make me do that. At this point, I'd only watched the stage hypnosis TV shows. I hadn't learned anything about hypnosis. My views of what it was and the power of hypnosis were entirely based on my judgments, interpretations of Paul McKenna's clicking his fingers and saying sleep, then telling people what to do and when to do it. I don't remember ever thinking it was false or fake, whereas growing up, I've met many people who say to me they think it's all fake. And people on these hypnosis stage shows must all be stooges. That thought never crossed my mind, but I did have a very naive and incorrect view of what hypnosis was, because I was basing my initial views on what I'd watched on TV. Obviously, the obviously and tantalizingly, it didn't reveal how to do the hypnosis. It only showed the results of people being hypnotized. I remember thinking about the Star Wars films and the Jedi using the Force, and wondering whether it was done like that. I really wanted to know how it was done. I set out to see if there were any books I could read on hypnosis to learn how to do it. I couldn't find anything in the local library, and it seemed difficult to find any hypnosis books in bookshops. As part of this lack of success finding books that would give me an answer, a part of this lack of success finding books that would give me an answer was frustrating, but at the same time, this made me more curious. I wondered why there were no books on hypnosis. Was it some big secret thing so powerful that they didn't want people to know how to do it? They wouldn't show or talk about how to do it on the TV program, so maybe it was something that only the privileged few could learn. The harder I found it to find any information about how to do hypnosis, the more curious I became about the subject. Eventually, after searching for a while in different bookshops, I found a self-hypnosis book and tape set. I've got it up here next to me. 
The set had a book explaining what hypnosis was and gave different inductions to use for hypnosis and wording for suggestions to overcome different problems. Then the cassette tape had two relaxation self-hypnosis sessions on it. The book was very simplistic in its explanation of what hypnosis was. And my first thoughts were that there was something special about the words in the book. I felt that to hypnotize someone, I would have to read the words exactly as they were written. It said to read the words in a monotonous voice, which for me wasn't a problem. That was how I spoke already, but it wasn't how I saw Paul McKenna speak on his show. This was in the days long before YouTube. There were only four TV channels, and there was only this one hypnosis program for me to go by and my one cassette tape. The hypnosis on the cassette tape was monotonous and very direct in the language it used. It said things like, you will now, you are now, and told me what I was now experiencing, which wasn't necessarily what I was experiencing. I didn't find the hypnosis on the cassette tape very effective. My view was that they seemed to get it wrong. If someone was telling me what I was feeling, and I wasn't feeling what they said I was feeling, then they were incorrect. If they're incorrect about this, then did hypnosis really work? If hypnosis was as powerful as I was imagining it being from what I'd seen on TV, then if a hypnotist said, you are now deeply relaxed and you can see a beautiful garden, this is what I expected my experience to be. I expected to be deeply relaxed, looking out over a beautiful garden, not feeling a bit relaxed and seeing darkness. At this point in time, this was also the only book that I'd found on hypnosis. And I was disappointed with most of what I read. It didn't match at all with the hypnosis I'd seen on TV. It didn't explain about what I could see being done. There was nothing in the book about influencing others about being able to say to someone, when I say your name, you're going to suddenly find yourself stuck in your chair, unable to move. The one thing that was in the book, which I almost completely overlooked, was the suggestions to give people to overcome problems. I'd never thought about people having problems like anxiety or low self-esteem. I just thought people were people. And the anxiety I felt in specific situations was just normal for me not something that anyone could change. The assumption made in the book, however, was that you could change parts of who you are. At this point, I'd never heard about counselling or psychotherapy, and this book was the first time I'd heard of a subject called psychology. But I still thought that there was very specific wording you needed to use to do different things in hypnosis. I didn't know where or how the author of the book had learned hypnosis, but I assumed there must be somewhere you could learn it. I was sure it wasn't a school subject because I'd never heard it mentioned in school or in lessons. And I thought the hypnosis scripts in the book were worded with the exact words needed to achieve what the script was about. I thought about hypnosis in the same way I thought about magic spells. Through my teens and into my early 20s, I'd been interested in the occult, ghosts, and many other paranormal subjects. And I still enjoy these subjects now, but my views and thinking have evolved and developed over the years. To me, reading a self-hypnosis book that had hypnosis scripts reminded me of books of magic spells and rituals. With these spells and rituals, I believed the wording and processes were the exact steps you had to take, like having to put a machine together correctly for it to work. To me, it was something you could change. It was not something you could change and adapt. In the same way, you couldn't put a machine together any old way and expect it to work. I couldn't relate to any of the problems mentioned in the self-hypnosis book, so I found them of no use or interest to me at the time. I did, however, try out some of the hypnosis inductions on my brothers and on my mum. I had no way of knowing if they had worked, I assumed I'd done hypnosis correctly because I'd read exactly what the, was written down, exactly as it said to read it. But I didn't have them acting like frogs or pretending to be astronauts. 
It was another hypnosis program of Paul McKenna's, a documentary called Paul McKenna's Secrets of Hypnosis, that suddenly opened my eyes to hypnosis and to understanding hypnosis in a more realistic way. The documentary started with Paul talking about his stage show and talking about what was coming up on the show, including someone being cured of a fear of flying, standing on the open back of a flying aeroplane, speed reading, overcoming pain, and much more. Paul explained a bit about what hypnosis was and how it worked in such a way that made me realise it wasn't necessarily all about the exact words. He explained that he couldn't reveal how someone was being hypnotised on TV, but he could reveal some of what the hypnotist is looking for when they're hypnotising someone. Paul then went on to explain various signs that the person is changing state and entering a hypnotic trance. The camera panned in close on the person being hypnotised and showed various signs like eye movement under the eyelids, reddening of the face, muscles relaxing, breathing slowing down and becoming deeper. These may sound like small points, but being told that the hypnotist is watching for certain signs meant to me that it wasn't so much that there were specific scripts or words to use to do hypnosis, but that the words used needed to be able to somehow achieve the changes sought. Paul explained that when people get absorbed in something like watching this program, they shut out everything else. They forget about the wallpaper, they forget about the TV stand and pictures on the walls and all the furniture. The only thing they're aware of is the TV programme. And if that TV programme is engaging enough, you suspend belief as you get drawn into the reality created by the programme. So if something scary happens on the programme, you can jump and be scared, even though what you're experiencing isn't real. Paul described how this is just like doing hypnosis and being hypnotised. To me, what Paul had done was reveal how hypnotic inductions were supposed to work. It wasn't about the words specifically. It was about creating this state in people. I still didn't really have the skills or confidence to do this, but I now knew and understood what I needed to learn. I also realised that it was largely about observing people closely. I'd never noticed people's breathing before, or changes to facial colour, unless they went very red from embarrassment, or from doing something energetic. I realised that I was going to have to learn a lot more about people, behaviour and body language, and was going to have to watch people with intent to see what I could learn about them. On the documentary, they had someone talk about cults, techniques used by cults, and how these techniques are essentially hypnosis. They had someone demonstrating using eye contact and gestures to convey an assertive message, and demonstrated language that politicians use to manipulate and influence people. I had watched many documentaries, I loved watching documentaries, but I hadn't watched anything that had an impact on me anywhere near as much as this one did. Paul managed to keep his hand in ice cold water without feeling any pain while thinking about a memory. Someone had managed to get rid of a skin condition through a number of hypnosis sessions. Different people were cured of phobias rapidly with hypnosis. Children had their immune systems boosted using their imagination. All of this made me start to wonder what the human mind was capable of. I started to wonder whether I could use hypnosis on myself to do different things. Firstly, I hypnotised one of my brothers to be better at playing pool. I found a snooker improvement script and just swapped the word snooker for pool and made a few other small changes to suit my brother, and it worked. He improved his pool playing. Then I hypnotised one of my brothers to stop wetting the bed, and that worked as well. I didn't use a script from a book for that, but I took a script from a second ha- uh, from a second self-hypnosis book I'd bought. Yep, uh, I'd read through the inductions, picking one I thought my brother would like, then read through the scripts, for treating different problems and found bits from the different scripts that I thought could be relevant. To those I added a few ideas of my own and read that script to him. These early successes gave me the confidence to start writing scripts for myself. As I learnt more about hypnosis I began to also learn more about rapport. 
I'd never heard about rapport before, but it was mentioned a lot in hypnosis books. Prolonged eye contact, like a hypnotic gaze, was mentioned. This initially confused me. I'd assumed that people spent all their time when talking with each other, staring at each other, because everyone says to you, look at me when I'm talking to you. Suddenly, I was reading a hypnosis, I was reading of hypno hypnotists saying, look into my eyes. Why would they need to tell people to look into their eyes if they were already looking into their eyes? The implication was that people aren't actually always looking into each other's eyes. I decided to watch people, and what I noticed was that there was a pattern to eye contact. It wasn't all or nothing. People don't stare at each other like I assumed they must do. Rather, they make eye contact for about five seconds, then they look away for a few seconds, then back again for about five seconds. When someone's trying to state something that is important to them, they hold eye contact for longer. When someone likes another person, they make eye contact with that person for longer during conversations, but they often seem to make less eye contact when they like someone and that person is looking back at them. People seemed to look away when they were thinking about things before responding to what was said, and they start looking away just before the other person has finished talking. All of this intrigued me. There were patterns to eye contact that perhaps I could learn. It made sense that a hypnotist would want to make prolonged eye contact because prolonged eye contact got attention and was hard to ignore. But the meaning of the eye contact seemed to depend on the situation. As a teenager, I didn't have the skills for mentally keeping track of this level of detail, especially not during conversations. So I stuck to what seemed to be about right, which was to make eye contact with people. Well, nearly make eye contact. I actually found it more comfortable to look through people which is still what I usually do. For almost five seconds, I would count these in my head and then break eye contact for about five seconds and just follow this pattern. I also started to notice how people had personal space. I disliked people standing too close to me. I'd go inside myself when people stood too close to me, but I didn't really get the difference between someone standing close to me because they wanted to be affectionate, someone standing close to me because we had to line up and stand close, and someone standing close to me because they were wanting to intimidate me and perhaps hit me. This meant that externally I was generally unresponsive. I'd go inside my mind regardless of the person's reasons for standing where they did. I never wanted to stand close to people, but I'd want to touch soft materials. I'd reach for people's clothes or touch people's coats if they were soft, as I walked past their chair, perhaps. And I wouldn't think about the consequences of this. Understanding people had personal space meant I began to see patterns when watching others, and I could learn from these. It is surprising that you don't see what you don't know to look for. And then when you do see it, you wonder how you never managed to spot it before. Since being an adult and starting to read books on the subject, I found myself disagreeing with much of what I see written about body language. But reading into it was definitely a good place to start. There was information about different facial expressions, about how there is a difference between a genuine smile and a fake smile. It comes down to the muscles around the eyes that create the crow's feet when you smile. So I started practicing smiling involving these muscles in front of a mirror because I wanted to be able to smile convincingly, especially when I hadn't got a joke or when I was, wasn't was really interested in something someone was saying, but I knew I should politely listen along. I learned about different hand gestures and how they could mark things out or reveal more information and about how they could be calming or aggressive, inviting or dismissive. All of this came from my interest in hypnosis. And as I continued to learn about hypnosis, I was finding that hypnosis is actually just about having advanced rapport building skills. Interesting for someone who needed to develop their most definitely not advanced rapport building skills. My mum had sent off for a free hypnosis introductory tape from a company offering training to become a hypnotherapist. Mum was also becoming interested in the 
in this idea of being a hypnotherapist. So we had both listened to and read the material sent through. I had also bought two Paul McKenna books, one teaching what hypnosis was and how to do hypnosis. And unlike other hypnosis books I'd read, Paul's book spoke highly of Dr. Milton Erickson and also spoke about neurolinguistic programming. NLP was something that other hypnosis books often glossed over. And they also glossed over Dr. Milton Erickson's contribution to hypnosis, dismissing it as not really being about hypnosis. Prior to the hypnotic world of Paul McKenna, all books described a totally different type of hypnosis. They described an approach to hypnosis I would now know is called authoritarian or classical hypnosis, whereas Paul's book spoke of modern hypnosis and described modern hypnosis as being Dr. Milton Erickson's approach, known as Ericksonian hypnosis, and NLP, neurolinguistic programming. This book described hypnotic communication as being an input from what the hypnotist observed about the client on or subject about their behavior, what they said and how they said it. This input would lead to the hypnotist giving some output in the form of words and behaviors, which would become the input for the subject. Then their response to what the hypnotist said and did would become the output that the hypnotist would pick up on as the new input. And this would cycle around. So it was a fluid process, not about hypnosis scripts, but about learning to pay attention to others and to communicate with others in a meaningful way. What I was reading about Dr. Milton Erickson was about how he used observation as a fundamental part of his hypnosis and therapy. He believed that most of our communication was unconscious. So by closely watching nonverbal behavior whilst listening to someone talking, you could get this extra information about what they were truly thinking and feeling. This nonverbal behavior is usually the honest part of the person. So when someone says yes with a smile on their face, but they shake their head, the shaking head being done unconsciously is most likely to be the honest answer to the question, not the smile and the word yes. I always say hypnosis is the thing that helped me learn to communicate. As a teenager, I still said and did things wrong and would take things too literally, but I now had a path. I believe many children with Asperger's are no different to me in that they are intelligent and able to learn, but they just don't know what they need to be learning or where or how to find it out. I don't think parents of those children know where their children can go to learn the skills they need. I've said to so many people with Asperger's that hypnosis helped me with it. And some people I know have tried hypnotherapy for themselves and felt that it never helped them. Then I've often explained that it wasn't using hypnosis in itself, although as an adult, I have used hypnosis to help in some areas, but it was learning about hypnosis that's helped me to become good as a hypnotist, you have to learn to observe people, to be able to copy people's behaviours, to be able to use your behaviour to influence the behaviour of others. You have to learn to excel at communication skills and to recognise patterns of behaviour and what different behaviours might mean, and then how to test your theories. Whilst in school, I never became able to manipulate teachers and other students into doing much of what I wanted, but I did realise that behaviours like how I had been influencing other children since primary school, for example, by suggesting ideas and then waiting for the idea to come from someone else, seemingly more influential, was actually doing hypnosis. I started to get on a little better in school because I could make normal looking eye contact, which helped me to fit in more. I still didn't care about most of what others said. It didn't interest me at all. And I still struggled to recall what people had spoken to me about, unless it was something I was interested in. But in the moment, I could now fake looking interested. Hypnosis gave me skills I could use as well. When I used to play Manhunt at night, I would use synesthesia so that I could see sounds. This helped me to know where other children were, because whenever they moved, I would see a flash of light coming from their location. I enjoyed the TV series Quantum Leap during my teens, and identified with Dr. Sam Beckett, 
as a role model due to his leaping through time from one life to the next and fixing people's problems, all the while remaining anonymous. I like the idea of helping people, but not taking credit for it, not being in the limelight. In one episode of Quantum Leap, Sam's playing pool and he has a hologram projected onto the pool table consisting of a dot on the white ball showing where he needs to hit the ball with the cue. There's also a dot on the object ball that he needs to hit with the cue ball and a line showing a path the object ball will take. I used to do this, but imaginarily, to help me with pool playing. I also managed to convince my teachers for PE to allow me to play pool in all of my PE lessons. We'd been asked what sport we wanted to do for our PE lessons. And the idea was that the sport we chose, we would have to do each lesson for the whole year. Discovering hypnosis was definitely the defining moment of my teens. That was the thing that gave me the skills I needed to handle life. It took many years to get things right, but because I became obsessed with hypnosis straight away and wanted to know how to do it, I developed enough basic skills to successfully navigate through my last couple of years of secondary school and into young adulthood. I've never been good at learning something and retaining it unless I saw a reason or had an interest in it. My view would be that all children should be taught hypnosis from a young age, especially children with autism, because what's needed is to study how to communicate with people, how to read the feedback you get, and what to do and say based on that feedback. It doesn't mean everything always works or that it's always easy, but it can give you a good starting place. Even in my autism spectrum disorder assessment, the psychologist said I had impeccable nonverbal communication, but there was no facial expressions. Even now, as an adult, I have to work at it. It can take years of practice and learning. I can do larger movements, but the more subtle the behaviour is that I am supposed to be doing, the harder it is to pull off. All the while, I'm essentially faking it and trying to do the response or behaviour that is correct for the situation by first working out what is correct for the situation. What combination of behaviours, how many different behaviours, gestures, body postures, small facial movements, appropriate eye movements, and so on. You see, this may be almost impossible to pull off during a conversation unless you are controlling the conversation, like in therapy sessions. So that's um, woohoo, quantum leap. So that's uh, the end of that chapter, but it's also the end of that part um, about how the thing that sort of transformed my life. I'm just scrolling up a bit, see what I've missed. Let's have a look. Right, I'm back at the snorkel. Yeah, my big reason for starting my this YouTube channel back in 2007 was purely because I found it so difficult as a teenager to find information about hypnosis that was um, helpful, accurate. Um, you know, you can find these sort of bunch of shelves here are my self-hypnosis ones. That was my first self-hypnosis book uh, that came with a box, in a box with a cassette tape. Um, and then that was my second one and just put that back in its place everything has a place um but they're very very basic they don't really go into much detail they just pretty much say read these scripts for these problems um and so when i set up so when I had the opportunity uh, and realized that there was YouTube around this thing called YouTube in 2007, uh, or I realized in 2006, I signed up January 2007 onto YouTube. Um, I saw it as, right, I can now share 
publicly i can just share this knowledge young people can then find it they can then learn the stuff that i really wanted to know and really needed to know um that as i discovered very early on to learn anything significant is hidden behind expensive paywalls you know to attend courses are thousands of pounds and um things have kind of got better nowadays there's so many people learning it and you can access it so cheaply uh, and you can find videos all across youtube but back in 2007 you couldn't find it all across youtube um and it caused a lot of problems for me with other hypnotherapy trainers back in 2007 when i started doing that but it was a case of i this is so valuable to me this has transformed my life um as has the stuff that springs off it. Like I just talked the other day about how counseling skills have transformed my life, where you learn about counseling. And so you learn about uh, eye messaging and you learn about uh, reflective listening and all these kind of skills are what should be taught as a package of training for autistic sort of children, teenagers, depending on sort of the level of understanding um, to depend exactly what you would teach at what age. But to me, all this stuff should just be taught. It, it seems odd that even today it's not. Um, and so I had always, I set the channel up to always teach that kind of thing, which is why, I, as those of you who have been around a long time on my channel, know how frustrated I was getting that all of a sudden my sleep meditations are taking off. And they're the thing that everyone wants to go to my channel for. And then YouTube are kind of treating my channel as a sleep meditation channel and not as a, an autism and mental health and hypnosis -y type channel. Um, and I'm there trying to cling on to, no, my channel is what I've always made it. It's why I set up this YouTube channel. It's what I came here for. And I was sort of fighting against this tide of, um, oh, your sleep meditations help me fall asleep. Um, and until September, obviously, that's what I kept doing. I kept fighting and fighting, desperately trying to cling on to the hope that somehow my channel would be able to remain this autism, mental health, um, kind of therapy education type channel that it had been for 13 years. Um, and my motivation for doing everything was, as a teenager, having so many struggles to find, to, you know, no one ever mentioned that there was topics that taught what you're lacking as a person, you know, taught social skills and taught, uh, you know, communication skills, things like that. And so it was like, I need to learn this stuff. No one's presenting this kind of knowledge to me. Um, people who learn it, so neurotypical people, people who've learned it instinctively as part of growing up, don't know it kind of as a, as a lesson. If I went to my mum and said, can you teach me about rapport? Can you teach me about eye contact? Can you teach me about breathing patterns? Can you teach me? She'd have no idea because she's learned all that as part of just being a human being who grew up neurotypically, who grew up and understood it instinctively as you grow up. Um, so it's not like you can just go to an adult and ask them. And yet there are courses that do teach a lot of this type of stuff. There are scientists who study this sort of stuff um you know there is information out there it's just that doesn't then filter down so to me it was very important when i had the opportunity that i taught this kind of stuff and made it freely available so that i could do my bit to try and help others who were in uh, probably in my the shoes i was in um who also aren't getting the support um but yeah so let me just read down Yeah, hypnosis shows can portray things in such a ridiculous way. Um, I'm not particularly a fan of hypnosis shows generally. Um, when they're done in a way of like, you know, we're going to make, we're going to hypnotize you and then make you, I want you to prance around like an astronaut. I want you to prance around like this or that. Um, so from a psychological perspective, it's like, wow, that's really interesting. How are they managing to get people to do these things? Um, but then as you grow up, you start thinking, oh, that's so embarrassing. I can't believe that they are that's what they're doing. They're getting people to behave like this. Um, but I do like people like Darren Brown and the way he uses 
hypnosis in the things he's done. Um, but I think it's if it's to make people look stupid for everyone else's entertainment, like instantly kind of go off it because I think that's it's a bit like comedy. When comedy is making everyone look stupid for the entertainment of others, then I'm not a fan of it. When comedy is kind of self-deprecating or observational comedy or something like that, then um, I'm far more a fan of it. Yeah, his I Can Change Your Life series was quite good. And he did his, um, is that the same series that, there was the series where he was treating impossible cases that obviously weren't impossible, but it sets you up in a win-win situation. If he failed to treat someone on the impossible cases program, then it was an impossible case. So it's fine. You can't expect him to succeed if it's an impossible case. Whereas if he succeeds in treating an impossible case, there's a big boost to his reputation because he's just treated someone who was allegedly impossible to treat. So either way, the hypnotist then never loses out because if they succeed, wow, that's incredible, you've cured an impossible case. If they fail, well, what do you expect? It's an impossible case. Um, Yeah, I think for me, Paul McKenna, one thing I've liked, so obviously from the stage shows, I didn't have this experience to know this, but, you know, from once getting hold of, I've obviously got all of his kind of CDs and tapes and things. Up there, I've got his, uh, okay, here are a couple of his cassette tapes um, and his books are up there as well. Um, I think it was once I heard his voice, I had heard other hypnotists' voices. As I say on the like on the um, book here, the tape, which is all the way up the top there, so I'm not going to get it down. But the cassette tape that came with that, the person's voice sounds terrible, as well as it being monotonous. Um, it just really grates on me. So everything about it was terrible uh, a couple of other hypnosis voices that i'd heard at the time i'm just trying to see if there's any next to me um i also thought found it sounded really terrible and really grated on me um paul mckenna and glenn harold were the only two voices which in sort of the late 90s where i started buying all the you know hypnosis tapes and things um the only two voices that kind of that I really liked Paul McKenna just his voice Glenn Harold I didn't like his voice so much as Paul McKenna's but I loved the sound effects I loved his e use of echo I know people hate my use of echo when I do it but the tracks I've put on YouTube where I've included echo I think there's one left on YouTube um are because I like it not because I care what other people on YouTube think um it's shared so that people can benefit from it if they want to listen to it, but it's made how I want to listen to it. Um, so I like the echo. I like that idea of when you've got headphones in, the, the voice seems to kind of resonate around your head while you're listening. And, and I like all that sort of stuff. Um, and so as those of you who've probably followed me for like 10 years or whatever will know, all my early stuff included a lot of, like if I was counting down, I'd be saying, you know, 20, 19, 18, 17. But if you've got headphones in, you'll hear my voice sort of 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12. And my voice spirals from the top of your head all the way down towards your feet as I count down. And if you're wearing headphones, you can actually hear my voice in your head. But hear my voice spiraling around you and kept passing down through you and I used to love doing things like that that was all of my stuff I used to post was doing things like audio things like that on the tracks um and having like multiple voices coming from different places so you'd have my voice talking here saying so as you begin to relax you can just pay attention to the sound of my voice and then there'd be a voice kind of here going going deeper and deeper more relaxed and then a voice sort of over here saying something else and so that if you're wearing headphones you've got these three voices that you can't follow all at once so you have to let go 
because you can't follow it. So you kind of um, go into a state of just acceptance almost. Um, so I love doing all that sort of stuff. And uh, it's time consuming, though. And now that I, in those days, I had a job. And so I did what I wanted in my free time. Nowadays, I'm self-employed. I don't do what I want in my free time. I work. Um, so I don't get time to do things like that just for my own amusement. Um, but yeah, so it's predominantly most of my adult life has been Paul McKenna and Glenn Harold have been the two that I listen to. Paul McKenna for his voice, Glenn Harold for his voice is okay, but then he's got the sound effects that I think, oh yeah, but I like the sound effects. So I'll keep listening to that. Um, And yeah, so another part of it, uh, I'm just having a look. Um, so obviously, hypnosis itself has no, you know, the only sign really that someone's hypnotized is if you've got a brain scan on them, you can see that the bits of the brain are lit up to say that this person's focusing their attention and they've um kind of shut down their inner dialogue and what have you um so someone who for example is hypnotized cycling on an exercise bike doesn't show any sign of relaxation or anything like that someone who um is hypnotized running doesn't show any signs of relaxation or anything um so what most people end up treating as thinking is hypnosis is normally signs of something else so for example when Paul McKenna was talking about the person being hypnotized and uh, what they were talking about was the person's doing a relaxation hypnotic induction on this person so that hypnotist is looking for signs that they're because um, obviously the two parts of hypnosis are that someone is um, narrowing their focus of attention and increasing their responsivity so that's what you're looking for. So if you're hypnotizing someone, say with a relaxation induction, then you're looking for that person to be narrowing their attention around the ideas of relaxing, which is what you're presenting and becoming more responsive to those ideas. So that when you suggest something like taking a deeper breath, they genuinely take a deeper breath. Um, so, uh, but there's often a lot of confusion over, uh, especially on some training courses, uh, over what signs are, are, are hypnosis and what aren't. And um, it's really about kind of those two points. And then everything else is about what are you trying to elicit in that approach that you're using at that moment in time. Um, but yeah, in relation to things like the sleep stories and hypnosis, I have gone through different stages. Sometimes I've thought I'm going to be open and honest about doing hypnosis. Other times I think, oh, I just won't bother putting that it's hypnosis because then people end up saying, oh, I can't listen to it because I'm religious or I can't listen to it because of this. Or, um, And if I do two stories, I've tried this. If I do two stories, say, back to back, um, say, a few days apart, you'll get people that will say, I listened to that first one and I really wanted to listen to that second one, but it's hypnosis and so I'm not going to. And there's no difference in either one, both of them. And the same if I say one's meditation and one's hypnosis. People will say, I'll listen to the meditation one, but I won't listen to the hypnosis one. But there's no difference in what I'm doing. Both of them are getting attention, narrowing that focus of attention and increasing responsivity to what I'm saying. That's the plan of what I'm doing, at least. Um, I can't guarantee that that's what's occurring for the listener. All I can do is... I always point out there's two parts to hypnosis. There's you can say you're doing hypnosis. That doesn't mean people are being hypnotized. And then there's being hypnotized. Um, so you can be doing hypnosis and it could fail. Yeah, it could be the person thinks I'm not going to pay any attention to what you say. Um, so and then you get lots of people who do hypnosis and don't even realize it's hypnosis because they've not learned about hypnosis or something. Um, Yeah, my brother doesn't mind the fact that I've included in my book that he um, learned how to play pool better. Oh, I'm not surprised someone would click a thumbs down. You just have to look at my face. 
Um, Yeah, I'm supposed to be, in theory, giving a... I say in theory because we never know what the future holds currently um, and whether things are going to go ahead. But I'm supposed to be giving a talk on um, uh, the Ericksonian approach at the UK Hypnosis Convention this year um, about how, obviously, Ericksonian approach isn't hypnosis and it isn't therapy. And I think a lot of people get really mixed up and think that it is hypnosis and that it is therapy. Um, so my talk is about how it isn't those things, but it is about what it is. Um, yeah, for me, everything's about texture. So food and stuff is all about the texture of it. There are some foods that I'd rather not eat at all because of the texture. Other foods that I would just keep eating because of the texture. Um, and when I read uh, Of Mice and Men, I instantly related with Lenny in that, which is very uh, a very sad story. Yeah, Quantum Leap is cool. Yeah, I went food shopping earlier. That was a fun experience. Yeah, it is common for people to want to know very specific ways of handling situations. Um, and that's fine. It's just normally that the way to tell those how to handle those situations things and more a case of being able to show it and so it's not something that's so easy to just like say like here and now for example um or type because i have obviously responded to people's questions as well in comment sections uh saying here's some ideas um but it's so much easier to actually have the person be shown how to do the you know how to um converse how to date you know how to do dating how to attend job situation job interviews or whatever and obviously that was part of my reason for writing my asperger's syndrome tips and strategies book which is tips for those with asperger's um their parents teachers friends and employers and the reason for writing that book was that nearly all the tips that are in there are in there but in there, you have to keep reading through to find the tips because I kind of mix them in with uh, what I'm saying. And they're a bit, they're not laid out as here is a tip. They're laid out more kind of, uh, you know, so I learned this. Or, um, you know, so if your child was displaying that, this would be a helpful way forward kind of thing. They're, they're kind of just suddenly conversationally within everything. Um, whereas this book, just pretty much get straight to here are the tips. Um, I use my own examples, but it gets to saying things like here are the tips uh, rather than anything else. And it includes things like, I'm just seeing if the, in, uh, just trying to see, no, nope, I don't have a breakdown of it, but it includes things like using, uh, so I'm just, I've just happened to flick to the adults with autism um public transport uh restaurants and shopping tips um i've got a chapter on interview tips in here and how to sort of manage interviews that's a chapter for friends Uh, I've got information about understanding others, about finding friends, um, learning social communication skills, uh, focus, 
relaxation, obviously. And so different types of relaxation depending on the type of situation. Um, so yeah, so there's different bits and pieces in there. Um, but ultimately I think it's the sort of stuff that is easier to do, which is why making videos is easier generally um, than trying to respond in text. That you can kind of do little demonstration-y bits, even on video, uh, like I did the other day of trying to talk about you know, if you're interviewed, for example, by a panel, this is how you would do it. And here's a structure of, say, a panel interview. And, um, you know, the person asks you the question and you respond looking at them. And then you look at while you're talking at the next person, next person, etc. And then you finish saying the answer back at them again. Um, but there is things like, you know, where do you focus your attention? Um, if you're focusing on I must get this job, you'll often be disappointed and won't get the job. So that's gonna affect you more so you have to sort of learn a number of skills and things um but it should all really just be taught it should it would be nice if it was all accessible that somewhere local to everyone you could just phone the local organization who would come and help um i'm often asked about the making a second channel um and the answer is i will never ever do that I have done that. I did. I set up a separate autism channel. Um, part of it is I get incredibly frustrated by the idea that I should have a channel that's all about autism and mental health, etc. And then because it's been taken over by people liking the sleep meditations, I then have to leave my own channel and set up a new channel with zero subscribers and then build it up from scratch again. Uh, and I, when I started doing this I so I did I actually did that um in 2018 I think it was 2017 something like that I set up a, once my sleep story started taking off and YouTube started treating my channel as a sleep story channel I specifically set up an autism channel because someone had suggested why don't you just do this and I thought okay I'll do that I'll forget this channel I'll close it down uh so I wouldn't delete I was going to delete things, but people said, no, please don't delete your stories. So I thought, okay, I'll stop. I'll close this down in terms of, I just will never post on here again. I'll never interact on here again because it's too much for my brain to cope with, to try and keep flicking from one channel to another and what have you. So I thought I'll ignore this channel. I'll just set up an autism channel and start from scratch and have to try and build this up again. And if it builds quick, brilliant, uh, because unlike in the past, so most of the years that I've had this channel, I've been employed. And so I've not needed to be kind of making the best use of my time to make an income because I've got an income from being employed. So I could then just do YouTube as something I would do like a couple of times a week. I would just uh, make a video or something. And then, um, so I thought, but this, so I thought if the new channel really took off, reasonably quickly i'd hit the threshold where i can start earning an income from it and then if it took off enough i'd be able to then justify putting time into doing everything on there and that i would then just transfer over all my videos on things like autism and mental health and everything from this channel to that channel uh, and just start re-uploading them there um but after like a year or whatever it was, uh, two years, I had so few subscribers. I don't think I'd even hit 100 subscribers, despite coming over here onto this channel and trying to say, remember, I've got this new channel that focuses on what this channel is supposed to be about, um, that I ended up just deleting everything off that channel and closing it down. Um, the reason for deleting everything is that initially I closed it down without deleting. I just thought, OK, I'll ignore that channel because I'm putting so much time into a channel that has no views and no subscribers um and generates no income so i can't justify putting that much time into it so i initially didn't just stop doing anything with it but then once every sort of three months i randomly would get a comment or something that i'd stumbled across that i'd find out i'd sort of find in my spam folder that someone had left me a comment on the channel so i thought the easiest thing is just delete all those videos because it would be like this video has had six views and it's got a comment already, but it's had six views in a year. Um, so yeah, so I would never do that 
again. Um, I have often thought of obviously just as I've talked about over some of these live streams, I've um, often thought about just scrapping this channel entirely and thinking uh, and deleting all of the sleep stuff off of it so that there can be no misunderstanding. This channel is about autism and mental health. All those people who subscribed kind of misinformed, thinking that it was about sleep stories and stuff. If I delete them all, there's no confusion. It's autism and mental health. But when I, obviously I'm very open. And so when I'd announced, look, this is what I'm thinking of doing. You're my subscribers. What are your views on this? A lot of people said, no, please don't. You know, we really want you to, we find these really helpful. They help us sleep. I had people say, you know, I've got cancer and this is the only thing that ha allows me to be able to kind of put time into my son or all these sort of things. So I thought, okay, I suppose people are finding these stories helpful. Um, and I saw it as, uh, as many of you disagreed with me, but I saw it as um, I was kind of, um, I don't know. I felt like a plumber who only ever went to houses and tightened a um, one bolt, you know, you know, one sort of washer or something in every house and had all these plumbing skills and never, ever got to use them anymore. I kind of felt like that, that um, all I was doing was making these sleep stories and I was no longer, as I've mentioned through numerous of these live uh, streams, people focus on me in relation to hypnosis and that kind of area. And obviously now story, uh, sleep meditations and things like that. But to me, my area of expertise is in mental health, um, parenting and family support work, autism and as a professional and because of being autistic. Um, and that to me, that's the area that I'm skilled in. And that sleep is just like one tiny slither of that. And so when it comes down to just largely focusing on, say, that one thing, I feel like everything I've tried to do for all these years has nowhere to go. Um, and so in September, obviously, I drew a line under it and told myself, I'm going to permanently draw a line under this. I'm not going to, apart from like Autism Awareness Week or something, I'm not going to try and help anyone in relation to any of that again, because I have to draw a line under it kind of for my own mental well-being. I have to draw a line under it to say, no, if everyone only wants one thing from my channel, I have to just focus on that one thing if I'm to keep my channel going because or else I either keep doing as I was doing up to September, I was posting autism videos and everything and they would barely get watched but i kept posting the content i was supposed to be posting on my channel um and not sleep meditations and stuff and so i thought the only way to make sure i stop posting all the stuff that i want to post is to tell myself or to just accept i'm no longer doing that um so i wouldn't do it on another channel um and i wouldn't make a big thing out of doing I wouldn't do it elsewhere uh, likewise I stopped doing live uh, talks and things around autism I just kind of uh, and mental health and everything I shut all of that part of my life down in September um, to make it that my focus is what people seem to want um, and to kind of suck it up and get on with it um, but yeah um, But yeah, it is that I like Glenn Harold and his uh, echo. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't include the echo again in my stuff because literally almost unanimously online, I love it. I listen to my um, old stuff uh, frequently and I like it. I find it really effective for me. I find it kind of really makes me go deep having this vibrating echoing voice going through my head and everything but i don't um it was almost unanimously hated on youtube 
So um, for whatever reason, um, it might be that people aren't listening with headphones and maybe from, say, a mobile phone speaker or a computer speaker, maybe that just doesn't sound, give the effect so they don't appreciate what it's like as an experience. But um, But I like it. Um, well, technically, for example, the Ericsson Foundation don't talk about Ericksonian, things like Ericksonian hypnotherapy or whatever. It's the Ericksonian approach. Uh, so obviously I've got a book called The Ericksonian Approach, uh, one of my hypnotherapy revealed series of books. Um, and yeah, the Ericksonian approach isn't hypnosis and it isn't a form of therapy um it's an approach that you can use to doing different things so it's an approach you can use when you're doing hypnosis or an approach you could use to approach how you do your therapy so for example say you're a cognitive behavioral therapist how you present that therapy to your clients or whatever you can approach from an ericksonian approach um likewise how you do hypnosis you can approach um from an Ericksonian approach, but the Ericksonian approach itself isn't hypnosis or therapy. Um, hypnosis is just narrowing focus of attention and increasing responsivity. And obviously therapy, there are lots of therapeutic models, uh, different therapeutic approaches, some more rigorously researched than others. Um, but yeah, but the Ericksonian approach itself is just a way of approaching doing different things so you could take an ericksonian approach to staff meetings you take an ericksonian approach to martial arts or to conflict uh, conflict resolution or um to many different areas uh, so as for most of my adult life as i have done i've taken an ericksonian approach to when i've done family therapy to when i've done uh, for like the local authority um to when I've done uh, working in children's homes and dealing with violent teenagers, um, to when I've been a manager and managed team meetings and things. Um, and I think there ends up being confusion. Uh, I remember when I was interviewed by Adam Eason, going back a number of years now, but I was interviewed by Adam Eason, and Adam Eason's not a fan, generally, of Ericksonian hypno hyp hypnotherapists. Um, because of their general kind of way of approaching what it is that they do. They end up kind of talking about an Ericksonian approach being all about being indirect and all that kind of rubbish. And that that totally mismatches with the science and everything else. And so um, I was interviewed and obviously asked about, you know, I'm, I'm sort of known as being an Ericksonian uh, therapy trainer so to speak, so Ericksonian dash therapy trainer. Uh, so I have an Ericksonian approach to uh, the sort of things that I would teach. And Adam's kind of end of the interview, I can't remember if it was on air or as soon as we finished the interview, was um, you've made it that I might actually revisit some of Erickson's work now, um, that you've given me a whole new way of looking at it that's different to how many other Ericksonian practitioners, so to speak, talk about it. Um, but yeah, but it's not, if you look at like Erickson's own documents, which obviously I've got his complete works black set there, that whole shelf, yep, that one there is all Milton Erickson's work, as is the rest of that shelf and the stuff on top and the stuff on top up there and the stuff kind of here some of this is Ericsson's stuff and right up the top which you can't see is a shelf of Ericsson's stuff and right up the top here that you can't see is a shelf of Ericsson's stuff either by Milton Erickson so everything there is by Milton Erickson pretty much so sort of that whole section that whole chunk there um everything above that and uh kind of down the side a bit uh, by his students as well um
so but what you read when you read through it all is that many of the students for example focus on various aspects of uh what ericsson used to do like you'll get jay haley focusing on his strategic type of stuff you'll get um Ernest Rossi focusing on the psychobiological side of stuff. Um, you'll get some people who focus on, say, his metaphorical stuff. Some people focus on his indirect language patterns that he had researched over his life. Some people would obviously focus more on all the language patterns. For example, if you look at Richard Bander and John Grinder's books um, on Ericsson's work. But if you read Ericsson's work itself, you see that this is just different bits of research that he did. His actual approach kind of underlied all of that research he did. Um, and what people have done is seem to take bits of the research or bits of the things that he said, oh, that seems to work well in this kind of setting. And then they've taken that as that's an Ericksonian, that is Ericksonian hypnosis or something. Um, yeah, the tips and strategies is was literally supposed to be tips and strategies for pretty much anyone. Um, Yeah, it definitely has never been, um, it even says in the title, for those with Asperger's parents, teachers, friends, and employers, uh, that's kind of the subheading of it. Um, the idea of it was to try and have it that there are tips for everyone all in one place, um, because as I talked yesterday, I think, about schools and secondary schools, um, it is very irritating the way some teachers, for example, um, will not seem to be focused on uh, from the perspective of the child's model of the world. And um, that leads to lots of problems. Uh, but then you get parents as well. I've often found that one of the biggest things with parents has been just literally they've never read a book or been taught anything about autism. And then their child ends up being diagnosed with being autistic and when you ask the parent, so uh, so I obviously work very solution focused. So I say, um, how will you know when things have improved? And they'll say something like, "Well, Johnny will be making, uh, will be looking at me when I'm talking to him," and no one will have told them that that lack of eye contact doesn't mean they're not listening. It's more likely a sign that they're autistic, which is what their diagnosis is. And so once you start explaining to the parent that lack of eye contact has no bearing on whether they're listening or not. And you talk about the fact that autistic people can have difficulty making eye contact at times, etc. And then you get into things like, so if you're saying that they'll look at you when you're talking to them, well, what's important about that? Well, I want to know they're listening to me. Okay, so how else can you know that they're listening to you? What would let you know that your child is listening to you? What can you do? How can you find that information out? And so you then just explore strategies, alternative ways of them getting that information so that they can fit, you know, like, do you ask them, um, you know, what was it I've just asked you to do? What's the age appropriate? What's the sort of sensible thing that can be done? And they'll come up with something that suits their child and their family situation and whatever uh, that might be totally different from another family. Um, so you're looking for, you know, why is it that that bit of behavior, like, why is it so important that your child says please and thank you to you? Well, because that's being polite. But if it just never comes naturally to them, you can keep sort of trying to help them to do it. But if you're going to lose your temper with them every time they don't say please and thank you, that's not going to encourage them to say it at all. Um, you know, so you sort of have to work out what's right for that child. Um, and that's what my kind of role used to largely be, that I'd be trying to help them to work out what's the right thing for their family situation, their child, um, or teenager or whatever it happens to be. Um, yes, I probably now wouldn't delete all my sleep meditations. Um, and uh, if anything, if I ever did decide to do something else or, you know, 
if I ever did decide to go back to focusing on, say, autism and mental health and stuff, it would just be a case of my channel would be sat here and I wouldn't be manning it, so to speak, um, because I'd be doing another channel. Um, and obviously you see that with lots of YouTubers. There's lots of YouTubers out there who have had channels and then they've had other channels. They've had the channel they call their main channel and then they've had another channel that's like their second channel. And then that second channel ends up being bigger than the main channel and they just end up never doing their main channel. But all those people who like that main channel stuff um, still get it. It's just that the person never interacts or reads it or looks at anything over there and never adds anything new to it. Um, but yeah, at the time I started talking about deleting uh, all the videos off of this channel, all the sleep meditations off this channel, was back in 2018 at the time apart from doing 40 for my 40th birthday i think there was only about 10 sleep meditations on the channel um and then the 40 were added to it across the year um or not just across the year they're added to it in 40 days straight um and that kind of suddenly put lots more sleep meditations on my channel but the problem was occurring before i did those 40 and initially youtube was still in limbo it was still treating my channel as what it was it was just that i was getting more people physically in the comments saying can you stop posting all these autism videos can you stop post i'd post something about autism or about depression or anxiety or panic attacks or anything like that and the videos would get comments saying i didn't subscribe to you for this kind of rubbish i don't care if you're autistic i just want the uh, sleep stories and I'd get more and more of those kind of comments, but the videos weren't doing sort of any much different really to the sleep meditations. YouTube was showing e both of them kind of equally. But then by the end of 2018, probably partly because I did all these 40 sleep stories stupidly, um, and I, I agreed with my subscribers that... I would post one new sleep story every time I hit a thousand subscribers because I said, I really hate doing the sleep stories. I really don't want to do them. I don't want anything to do with them. I hate doing them that I find that I get so angry when I do them. Um, but everyone kept saying, please keep doing some. And so I said, I'll do a new story every single time I hit a thousand subscribers. That way it's kind of best of both worlds. I'm hitting a thousand subscribers roughly every month or so. So you'll probably get a sleep story a month on average or every six weeks. Um, I'm then doing something that you're, you're saying you want and I'm getting subscribers. So obviously it's kind of a thank you for that. Um, and I stopped doing that because lots of people complained saying that even though the subscribers were the ones that kind of negotiated with me, that this was a good way forward. Um, lots of new people discovering my videos said you're blackmailing your audience you should do it because it's your job you shouldn't do it because um people subscribe to you and so that then made me stop doing it and totally stop doing sleep stories entirely from late 2018 until the middle-ish of 2019 where i uh, uploaded some random ones that i hadn't posted before on this channel and then um just decided I'll just jump in. Um, just having a read. Yeah, the, the thing about the ones with the echoes is they're all completely random types of subjects. So they're things like just for different sort of self-help reasons. Um, they're really bad audio quality, obviously, by modern day standards. Um, because they're all recorded when I didn't have the kind of digital stuff I've got now. So many of them have a buzz on them. And um, so they're not the sort of thing I'm likely to share nowadays um, because they're not at a standard that I would be happy to really be reposting. Um, I think the thing with uh, like, um, like Dave Elman, I have used some of his stuff occasionally. Um, 
they're not necessarily always incredibly direct. So Dave Ellman um, does perfectly fine with what he does, um, but it, but they might not be so flexible necessarily in terms of what their approach is. So Milton Erickson was frequently incredibly direct, which is why it then gets really frustrating when you hear people talk about the indirect approach and talk around about, oh, Milton Erickson, he just did indirect stuff. When Milton Erickson frequently would tell you what to do and how to do it and when to do it and all this sort of thing. Um, but it's about having it. Um, obviously, the whole point is that it's got to be client led, not therapist led. And I think that's the big difference that and obviously that's the difference in relation to a th an Ericksonian approach is that an Ericksonian approach is client led, not therapist led, whereas um, there are many therapists and hypnotists who are therapist led or hypnotist led who impose an approach on you because that is the approach they do. And uh, whereas an Ericksonian approach doesn't impose an approach on someone, what it does is it takes the lead from the client about how the approach is going to go and what you're going to do. Um, so if the client needs you to be direct or if it's perfectly fine to be direct with the client, then you're going to be direct. If they need it to be softened in some way a bit, uh, then it might be softened. If they need it to be more indirect, it might be more indirect. So you're always taking the lead from the client about what you're going to say and do with every kind of step of what you're doing. Um, I've got about 70 videos, I think, plus obviously all these live ones on um, autism over on this channel in a playlist. So that's quite a few hours worth of stuff, um, as well as obviously my three books, plus all of my blog posts over on my um, uh, website, danjoneshypnosis.com. Yep, I've frequently shared over the years about how angry I get making the sleep meditations. I get less angry if I do them on air, not because I'm in front of people. I'm more than happy to be angry in front of people if it if I am angry, um, but because of the way it's done. So when I do the live live streams that many of you have been a part of, the next one will be on Monday at 10 p.m. Um, it's totally different. It's uh, it's a different context. It's uh, I'm given plenty of content to work with. Um, I think people don't necessarily always realize how difficult it is to just suddenly do something. Like if I said to everyone on this stream now, right, what I want you to do is turn on an audio recorder right this second and create a 30 minute spontaneously just create a 30 minute um sleep story that helps with anxiety stress worry and is done in a way that's going to help the person to fall asleep and the chances of people then uh, i try i suspect the chances of many people then saying yeah i can do that right away and i won't get angry i won't get frustrated with myself um i won't suddenly think why can't i think of an idea Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, especially if you do loads of them, you know, um, where you end up thinking that's just too similar to the one I did last week. That's too similar to the one I did two weeks ago. That's too similar to this one. Or no, this just sounds rubbish. And, you know, I'm betting many people would think um, actually that's not an easy task to do, especially when you're doing it all the time, um, you know, to do like I used to do in the old days. Uh, I often say the old days and then have someone comment about Zimmer frames. But um, back in the old days, I would just do the odd one. It would be like, oh, I've just suddenly woken up this morning with an idea that I think would make a really good um, therapeutic meditation. I've got, I'll normally get like a metaphor, say a metaphor that I think would be a brilliant metaphor for helping with say, anxiety. And so what I would do is then go out of my way to go and turn that metaphor for anxiety into a whole story because it's in my head and I've got this idea. And then it could be three or six months later, I suddenly get another idea that I think, oh, I've just suddenly got an idea that I think make a brilliant uh, metaphor for 
stress and then I go and turn it into a story and that's kind of how it used to work in on my channel until like 2018 ish where suddenly people were wanting these stories all the time up until then it was kind of uh, oh I've got an idea on um, metaphors that I could use for making a story about coping with um, bereavement so I'll then go and make a story about that oh I've suddenly got an idea for a metaphor for coping with weight loss yeah you know, for helping to lose weight so I'll then go and do a story about that and that's kind of how it kept on going and then it was like right every single day we really want you to make a story um and that is quite a tough thing to suddenly do and then that makes it it's now a chore and a very stressful chore rather than it being um a creative adventure you know a creative thing where you're suddenly getting this idea in your head or um, and so that's kind of what I get from doing the live streams that never mind how much people unsubscribe from my channel because of the live streams and stuff like that what I get from it is the engagement of people where you suggest tons of ideas that I've got to work with so I can genuinely create something that feels like a story that I've never created before or never told before and I don't know where it's going to go and how it's going to go till I start it like I didn't know last Monday's story was going to be a romance story until it was suggested to be a romance story I didn't know that it was going to take a f how it was going to then be a romance story until pocket watch was suggested and then I suddenly thought of this idea of yeah, you know, and then people what you find is that people start suggesting stuff kind of related to the stuff that's already suggested and so then there was like watchmaker was suggested or whatever so I suddenly started getting this idea in my head of something happening that makes you have to go to a watchmaker's with a pocket watch well how do you get the pocket watch and how do you then, you know, so you take other ideas that are around and you start figuring out how a pocket watch can be gained. And then you end up thinking uh, someone had wanted hugging. And so I, and um, they said they feel like they really need a hug. So I thought, well, I want to be able to give you a hug. Let's do that in this story. So in the story, I wanted to make sure there was a moment where there would be a loving kind of really nice hug that the person really wants to get you know that they're so kind of into that hug that they rest their head on the shoulder of that person who's hugging them and they feel that sense of warmth and love etc so I wanted to make sure that was in there um and so you start creating this story that you had no idea moments earlier that you would create and it's going to take some random path that you didn't know you know you've never done that before that specific type of story or that specific path of story or whatever and um and so that's so much more creative, I find. Um, and I find that so much more relaxing to do than, you know, I've got a story I've got to create for Wednesday. So let's sit down in front of a microphone and try and do it. And then I'll stare at the microphone and I'll try something and try another idea and another idea and another idea. All of them, I think, oh, that's rubbish. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. Um, which is why, regardless of, um, what people how people subscribe or unsubscribe in relation to the live streams there are people who engage in them meaningfully and in a way that helps me to be able to help you lot to be able to have what it is you like also the long stories as well you're not likely to get a long story unless I randomly stumble on an idea that I think oh, I really like that and it goes on for an hour or something you're not likely to get a long story unless I do the live streams um purely because of how my brain works and how it all works around it. And it's so much more relaxing, even if I don't necessarily want to be sat in front of a computer at like midnight, uh, as I have sometimes, um, doing still talking. Um, it's more relaxing and more of a calming experience than it is to... Um, uh do it myself just in an empty room um but yeah i've often responded to i get comments now where i someone will comment saying um i've watched this video this sleep story now i want another one today and i'll think um my channel uh it's just demanding isn't going to make it happen um and i'll often reply pointing out that I use the meditainment uh, 
tracks quite a lot. Uh, they're currently, for those who don't know, I've shared the link over on Facebook in the Dan Jones Sleep Stories Guided Sleep Meditations sort of Facebook group. Um, they're currently offering for you to be able to access 20 of their tracks for free because of the situation that's going on. Um, but I use the meditainment tracks and I've essentially used the same two or three for the last 20 years. It's been since about 2001 ish, 2000, 2001 ish that I started listening to those from one CD and they were good enough for me. I carry on using them. And I know that the more you use the same thing, the more effective it becomes because your brain learns the pattern of how to respond to that one thing. Um, but I do often get the, um, I listened to this, I was asleep in five minutes, do another one. And I think literally you've missed 55 minutes of it by falling asleep, which is fine, but I'm not going to do another one because you demand it. Um, so yeah, so I personally, think that I don't know any other or I don't think I have seen another artist with as many sleep meditations out there as I've got on my channel which is nearly 200 I think um, of all different sleep meditations um, and yet people seem to think that's not enough and that they demand another new one rather than going through 200 which is more than enough that if you listen to them one a night 200 days later you can or 201 days later or whatever you can listen to the first one again it's not like you have to listen to them even because of the quantity it's not like you even have to listen to them uh, um for any kind of period of time uh let's see Yeah, so it confuses me sometimes that people say that they, uh, yeah, like when people say um, about how they just assumed my channel's all about sleep meditations. And I think I literally only started posting frequent sleep meditations in September 2019. Prior to that, people have never had frequent sleep meditations on my channel, apart from. 40 sleep meditations over 40 days up to my 40th birthday in 2018. Other than that period of time, between 2007 and now, most videos which I've posted, for example, 2015, 2016, I was posting five videos a week on my channel. I was posting every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And on top of that, I'd occasionally, if something cropped up to me that I just wanted to share, post on a Saturday and Sunday. So you were getting five videos from me every single week for 2015 and 2016. For 2017, I was posting three videos a week. And I think I posted like four sleep meditations in 2017. In 2018, uh, maybe six, I don't know, but it was very few. Um, in 2018, I posted 40 for my 40th, but I was posting a video every single week that was nothing to do with the sleep meditations. Um, they were never a scheduled video. There was 40 for my 40th. And the only other ones were the ones I did every time I hit 1000 new subscribers, which depending on the time of year, sometimes could be once every month, sometimes it could be once every six weeks. And then I stopped all that in October 2018-ish. Um, because I thought, no, I've had enough of this now. This is getting stupid. My channel's turning into a sleep meditations channel. And um, But by then I'd recorded, as some of you will know, I recorded the uh, me sitting down reading the first chapter of The Odyssey. So I shared that at some point late in December, I think, um, because I'd recorded it. I just hadn't edited it, and I'd recorded it like in October or whatever, November. Um and then I, but I didn't post anything else. And then in like April or May or whatever, I shared a couple of the videos that I'd done the previous year, but never posted because I'd stopped posting. And because of Abby's mum having a stroke in 2018 and uh, Dr. David Lewis, um, me sort of doing some bits with him, 
I kind of ran out of time for some of my videos. So I decided oh, I'm just going to post uh, these couple of sleep stories just for three weeks. I think it was back to back just to give me three weeks before I have to post the next proper video. Um, but other than that, I then didn't post until September. And yet I frequently hear people just thinking that I've posted almost continuously sleep stories. Um, Do I have all the books I've written together? Um, kind of. I've, well, I don't know. Yes and no. I do have copies of them all together in a box. Um, so that's a yes. But at the same time, for example, my hypnosis ones are over here on the hypnosis shelves. My autism ones live over on an autism shelf. Um, so they also live, I've got, more than one copy of my books so they also live in their correct place depend you know there's no point having a hypnosis collection if my own hypnosis books aren't a part of that collection um yeah also i try and release completely different types of stories as well as many of you've probably um noticed so my you know i release stories that are first person um as if you're experiencing it um and i always point out first person because it's supposed to be an experience like a first person computer game it's not like you're reading a story from a first person uh, kind of thing um which is wrong uh wording it's uh i i do third person obviously I have stories where it could be a male lead, a female lead, an animal, potentially an animal lead. Um, it could be that the lead is intentionally ambiguous as to their sex because whoever's listening, I want them to be able to identify with that individual. And so I don't want that individual to have a known kind of gender because I want the person listening to be able to um, project that onto the character so that they so that you'll get someone that will think, oh, I always thought it was a man, or oh, I always thought it was a woman, or whatever. Some people then get really annoyed. They say, I just want you to say he or she. Um, but then in everyday life, I almost never say he and she to, to people. I just say they. My preferred language is to always describe people, animals, everything as they. I almost never use some kind of agenda. Um, kind of word to describe people so it's really odd that as i've learned from doing the stories that others seem to for some reason want that uh, or get really offended if it's not there um yeah i have stories where the characters have um, mental health issues where the characters have uh yeah things like autistic um where the characters um are have physical disabilities where the characters have um you know are perhaps uh um you know straight or you know gay lesbian whatever uh that i try to just sort of make it that people can then find what they like and listen to what they like um and some things people will resonate yeah i have stories that include topics that i know people will like and then other people will hate like scuba diving you know some people will love scuba diving other people will say no i feel all trapped and claustrophobic if i'm underwater so then that's not the right story for them uh, and then i try to put things into as many playlists as i can um so that people can then try and find the kind of thing they like and if they like for example things with scuba diving in you can find the list of stories that include underwater stuff but then if you know there's stuff you don't like, you can find the playlists that have that. See if any of the scuba diving-y, the underwater stories are on that playlist. Any that are, don't listen to those ones because you know they're going to have those issues in that you don't like. Um, any that aren't, well, then listen to them. So I never expect someone to listen to the playlists. And I actively discourage people listening to the playlists because um, clearly that's not sensible on youtube because you're likely to get adverts between the uh stories and you're also likely to 
end up with my normal kind of like, subscribe, share introduction at the beginning of each one. So I always recommend if you want to listen to more than one back to back, either use the compilations or go and listen to the um, uh, Sleep Stories podcast or use Spotify or something else to listen to them. Um, But yeah, so again, the having them on a loop, I'd recommend you know one of the all night uh, compilations uh, for that. I like my people. Isn't there a song with People Are Strange? I think it's odd when I hear someone say they don't trust anyone enough to let them hypnotize them when hypnosis helps you to be far more in control of yourself um, and to be far more empowered. And so it seems really odd um, because obviously the hypnosis research is that when you're hypnotized most people are less suggestive when they're hypnotized a small number of people are more suggestive they think that they're supposed to the, the theory is that they think they're supposed to be more suggestive and so they act more suggestive um a small number of people there's no change in suggestibility and most people become a bit less suggestive because you're in a position where you're kind of your senses are all, all heightened and because all of your senses are heightened you're more aware of um what's going on you're more aware of manipulation etc you know more aware that you feel uncomfortable because of a certain tone of voice the hypnotist has used and you may not consciously know why you suddenly felt uncomfortable but because of that tone of voice they've used you just don't trust that suggestion so you don't follow it and obviously you always have the freedom to just open your eyes and say, not having this and walking off. Um, yeah, people are definitely meaner online generally because they don't have to see you. There's kind of, it feels like there's, I assume, feels like there's no comeback so you can say and do what you want. Um, Just trying to see if I've got that. Hypnotism, it's history, practice, and theory. Jay Milne. I definitely have that somewhere here. Let's have a look. History, so it should be somewhere here. I do definitely have it. Don't know why I can't see it. Probably because I'm on air. Nope. It's about that. But yeah, I have got that somewhere. I thought it was on that shelf there. It might be. Uh, uh, uh. Just wondering if it's among my old books here next to me, given the date you've just shown. So it might be somewhere among my old books because of the date. So on my shelves, um, let me just scroll up a bit. I have got a list of all of my hypnosis books. Um, on my shelves, I have everything in its right place everything has a place but 
I specifically for anything probably under about 1920, so older than say 1920-ish, uh, I specifically have among my old hypnosis books, so anything that looks like an old hypnosis book rather than a modern book, um, I pretty much have among my other really old hypnosis books. So even though they might be um, books that come from, uh, like there might be self-hypnosis books, which would normally sit here on the self-hypnosis section. They might be history of hypnosis books, which would sit at the back end here among the history of hypnosis section. Um, they might be professional hypnosis books, in which case they'd be on this row back here. These are the ones I'd recommend people read if they want to know actually about hypnosis, not the ones on self-hypnosis and stuff like that. Um, but then I've got things like medical hypnosis by, uh, let me get one of these out. So I love books like this by Lewis Wahlberg. This is uh, an old book. Smells nice. It's also a signed, smells very nice. Now my nose is next to it. It's also a signed copy. Um, but that's a two volume set. Um, so that's there because it just sort of fits there, but, and it's not quite old enough for me to warrant it to be on my old shelf. Um, but yeah, so I've got a list of all of my in print hypnosis books. So I've got hundreds and hundreds of hypnosis ebooks as well. Um, and have kind of what 700 or whatever hypnosis books and so all of these sort of 700 hypnosis books i've got a list of them all um but yeah i've got a list of my own books I was reading that as a list of my hypnosis books is in a list of all my ones I've collected, but yeah, I've got a list of my hypnosis books on my website, a list of my autism books. Um, my hypnotherapy revealed series. I'll just open the front page of one of them. Well, not the front page, but a couple of pages in, uh, my plan is to end up doing the 10 volumes that listed there. Well, oh not happy with the light um i've done two and i've partially done eight so i'm just working through them thank you for recommending my sleep meditations yeah my web address isn't difficult danjoneshypnosis.com yep that's the one Yep, that's the song I was thinking of as well. I've got, um, I think, four all-night compilations at the moment, or three all-night compilations, um, but they're done kind of in bulk of these are the uh, collections of stories from this period of time. So there's like, these are ones from like 2018, these are ones from... 2019 these are ones from uh 2020 etc um so they're all done in bulk kind of compilations that is the song The Lost Boys is a very good film. I've, well, I've got all three of the Lost Boys films, but the first one is significantly better than the others. I don't think Abby does come in here and switch her books around. When I used to live in a different flat and she would come and pick things up and look at things and be nosy, I would notice when they'd moved. Um, and people have done that on purpose in the past. 
uh, medical hypnosis is pretty much the use of hypnosis within a medical context. So using hypnosis for things like pain management, um, you know, anxiety, um, essentially what people would say are hypnotherapy, uh, you know, clinical hypnotherapy, um, yeah, surgery, so for doing surgeries and stuff. Yeah, although currently I'm not looking at the camera. I'm staring over here. Um, so you don't have a problem of me staring at you on these videos because uh, recording them live, I'm staring over at the side. Um, the oldest book I've got, 1786, I think. It's a book on uh, mesmerism. There is a Lost Boys 2 and 3. They're rubbish, but. They're worth watching if you haven't seen them, and you can pick them up for so ridiculously cheap. Um, but yeah, so the oldest book I've got, I can't read because it's in Old French. Um, the second oldest book I've got, I got it out the other day because it kind of relates to our current situation. I think this is the one. Abby got me this, um, I think, for my birthday last year. So this is 1791, about solitude. So chapters are things like the advantages of solitude, the influence of solitude upon the mind, the influence of solitude upon the heart. And the pages feel really nice. They feel like um, uh, cotton paper, which is nice. So it's just a small little book. I'm probably the only person I know who goes into clothes shops and pubs and looks at all the books that they've got on display. Um, that in clothes shops, there are some clothes shops that have old books as part of their displays. And I spend my time looking around their books. Um, the same in pubs. And I think, oh, I hope they'll sell them to me. Who's the author? Um, J.B. Mercer. Is a translator. So you can have a. I'll show this. Show it again for anyone who wants details. Yeah, here you get it quite often. I think think it looks rustic and nostalgic. Yeah, the books aren't for sale, but I always hope that they'll sell them if I um, ever asked. Um, I think I've only ever approached one. It was a cafe I approached because I wanted one of the books, and they just said, just take it. It's literally to them. They got it as uh, you can buy bulks of really old books um, that are just like random books, and a company will just say, do you want a, a bunch of random um old books for like 30 quid or whatever and they'll sell you those random books and uh so you never know what you're going to get as a company um but it then looks good obviously on the bookshelves uh what was the book what the one on solitude that i've just spent twice showing oh what was the book i got from the cafe i can't remember it was a psychology book of some kind I thought you meant the one that I was just showing twice. I thought, what are you doing? Looking the other way two times in a row. <laughs> but yeah, it was a psychology book, but I can't remember what the what psychology book it was off the top of my head now. It was a number of years ago. Um, and that was in, I think, Cafe Nero or something. 
but yeah, I have got lots of uh, um, different interesting old books. I do like my old books. I like sort of handling them and smelling them as well as reading them. But I like um, especially hypnosis books. I like old hypnosis books because it's earlier in the field. And so you get a different taste of what they thought about hypnosis then and kind of some things can get lost through history. There can be things that people focus on a lot because at that time it's kind of a hot topic of research or whatever that just as time goes on, it stops being a hot topic. And then you read about it and you think, oh, I've never thought of doing hypnosis in that way because there's like an old indu induction, for example, that they were doing back 120, 130, 140 years ago that you think, oh, actually, that's quite a good, I I'd quite like to give that a go. Uh, likewise, you also get things like, oh, I never thought about the research on that. And so you then find little research topics that you learn about. Um, but yeah, and all the outfits in these old books are so much more fun. Um, you know, I've got things like uh, everyone had a moustache back then. So this is among self-hypnosis books. Um, squeeze that back in there. So yeah, so everyone seem to have moustaches and you get uh, trying to carefully lift different books out see if there's anything with interesting photos no, I thought that one might have interesting photos in although that did smell nice to flick through and I've obviously got the book that started it all um, in a plastic bag That book there is the book that started all of hypnosis, technically. Doesn't look like much. Um, that's obviously a first edition of Neurocnology. By James Braid. From 1843. So this little carrier bag has my oldest books in, or yeah, you know, my sort of rarest or most expensive, or I don't know what the right term be. They're probably not all my most expensive. Oh, I'm dropping juggling balls. Um, I don't know, I've just put it back. I do have uh, also James Esdale's book. Um, the uh, da, 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 Mesmerism in India. I've not heard of Little Free Libraries, but maybe we do have them, I don't know. But I do have quite a few signed hypnotherapy books, of different sorts. I've got um, Dave Elman's Findings in Hypnosis, which he self-published. This one's signed to his sister. Findings in Hypnosis got published. If I can put that back up there, as hypnotherapy, which is what most people would better know it as. And then I've got things like uh, Encounters with the Past. which the interesting thing about this, I think it's this one, yeah, is that it's uh, 
contains records which are uh, people um, sharing their uh, past lives allegedly through um, hypnotic regression so that's just interesting because obviously you don't often get books with records in And then I've got loads of, um, in fact, you really wouldn't want to get me on talking about my books and things. Loads of books on um, subjects kind of up here linked to hypnosis uh, and also linked to things like religion as well. So this one's um, psychology, religion and healing. And then it talks about hypnosis and different subjects in there to do with that. Sorry for the groin shots if I'm giving you that. <laughs> um, and then obviously this is the book that I contributed a chapter to, which is Clinical Hypnosis Textbook <clears throat> uh, by Professor Ursula James. Um, probably one of my old ones. I don't know which one. Um, Different ones have different qualities. So I actually like, if I just put this back. I love the feeling of this book, uh, Trilby, which obviously many of you know Trilby. Uh, this is from 1894. And it's obviously the book that stars a famous evil hypnotist, Zvengali. Um, as you can see there. Having plenty of fun, obviously dancing around a dance hall, I'm sure. Um, but that is such a ridiculously heavy book. That feels like a doorstop. It's not particularly big, but it feels kind of doorstoppy and ridiculously heavy. Um, and I do like the cover. It's all indented and everything. And So that's one I like kind of the feel of for the weight. But then there are others like the one I got a minute ago on isolation with the cotton material pages feel really, really nice to touch. Um, Whereas I actually also like some of my, uh, uh, so I've got a big stack of novels and things from over the years that have hypnosis as a reasonably key feature to the novel as well. Because I quite like, obviously, hypnosis in fiction as well as, um, I don't really read much fiction, but I quite like, I have an obsession with hypnosis, as people might notice. And so when something comes out that involves hypnosis, whether it's Marmite or whether it's uh, a novel, I often want to have that on my shelf. Um, I used to, my entire, all my hypnosis stuff largely was non-sleep story hypnosis. Um, my channel used to be full of self-hypnosis for various things from weight loss, stopping eating sweets, stopping eating chocolate, um, increasing metabolism, um, multiple pain management, self-hypnosis stuff um there was hypnosis stuff around um uh, becoming more youthful as we talked the other day there was hypnosis uh, self-hypnosis stuff around i don't know there's there was hundreds of self-hypnosis videos that i used to have um there was dozens of just inductions as well so to give people a, a, an experience of different types of hypnotic inductions I would do things like, there are short videos, but they're like five minutes where it's just the induction, 
give you a couple of minutes of just being in a absorbed internally for a moment, not for any real purpose other than to give you that experience of the induction itself. And then I'd say, that's it in three, two, one, coming back out of hypnosis or one, two, three, come back out of hypnosis, whatever. Um, so there was literally vast amounts of that. Plus there was, um, I had about 50 or 60 or so hours of educational um, videos, a series of, I think, 100 videos or something of educational hypnosis videos on my channel um, where you could follow, uh, you know, from learning basic hypnosis all the way through to more advanced stuff. Um, that used to frequently get shared among multiple hypnosis forums, which was really handy. And that used to get loads of views in like 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, but then in 2010, 2011-ish, I deleted nearly everything off my channel um and totally got rid of it a lot of it and <laughs> um ended up getting rid of a lot of it and then um just never putting it back onto my channel again so there are still some self hypnosis things and i did when i was releasing three videos a week one of those three videos a week was always a self-hypnosis guided meditation type video that was around a therapeutic topic, whether it was weight loss or whether it was overcoming phobia or whether it was anxiety or whatever. So there is lots of different stuff on there. Um, but the only weight loss one I think that's left on my... No, there's a few weight loss ones. There's a weight loss story. Um, I think it was The Farmer, something like that. Um, someone else will probably remember better than me. Um, there was weight loss meditation, I think, on my channel. And then there's the weight loss track that I made for myself when I wanted to lose weight a few years back, back in 2010. Um, there's the track I'd made for myself back in 2010, used it to lose two stone or whatever in two months, um, and then decided I'd share it onto my YouTube channel. So that's on there as well. Um, I don't think I've got any more. I think it's just those three that are on there now. Um, Just seeing comments. Yeah, the um, you know, the trouble with hypnosis, Michael Yapko, I will grab his book because it will be somewhere behind me. It should be somewhere behind me. It is somewhere behind me. Where is the question? Um, while you will stand at the back of my, stare, stare at the back of my head even. Um, oh no, I put Michael Yapko's books all together. Uh, Michael Yapko wrote a book, Mindfulness and Hypnosis. And the main kind of basis of this book is... He, he kind of went through a stage where he was teaching a lot about how mindfulness as it's used in cognitive behavioral therapy. So as many of you probably know, if you seek cognitive behavioral therapy, they'll often do mindfulness based cognitive behavioral therapy nowadays. Uh, it's quite a popular thing. Mindfulness used in cognitive behavioral therapy is nothing like mindfulness as in the thing that you might get uh, or might sort of discuss sort of, I don't know what the right, is. you're not discovering it, you're not getting it. You might have as part of, say, if you went to a Buddhist temple or something. Um, so mindfulness within a therapy context is totally different. And how it's done is no different to doing hypnosis. So Michael Yapko obviously wrote a book kind of advocating, saying, why don't all hypnotists just stop saying that they're doing hypnosis and just do mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy because you're doing exactly the same thing. 
the cognitive behavioral therapist who does mindfulness will say, just take a moment to focus on the top of your head, focus on your shoulders, focus on relaxing your chest, relaxing your body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The hypnotist, the cognitive behavioral hypnotist would say, just get a sense of focusing on top of your head, focusing on your shoulders, focusing on your breathing, focusing on your um, stomach, et cetera, et cetera. They'll just do exactly the same process. And then they'll say, whatever the therapy part is, you know, focus on uh, just letting those thoughts be there, not attaching to them, all these kind of things, you're doing the same thing regardless. Um, and so Michael Yapko's view is hypnosis has had a lot of years of having a bad press. It evolved out of mesmerism, which came from a time when a lot of people felt you know, we're kind of still into the occult and stuff like that. And they felt that this trance thing is probably linked to some kind of occult thing. So it came out of that, became hypnosis, but still was linked to the whole occult thing because of the trance aspect. And then started getting taken seriously by scientists. But at the time, scientists started taking hypnosis seriously, like James Braid, etc., who tried to make it more legitimate you had other people now suddenly using it for stage shows and then you know doing stage hypnosis through the late 1800s and then onwards and then you had alongside that suddenly novels were being written because people kind of look like they're all tranced out and then uh, and what have you and um they respond to a hypnotist suggestions and all this kind of stuff all of a sudden you ended up with novels like trilby springing up where hypnosis is part of that novel in some kind of evil way, like with an evil hypnotist like Svengali. And so there's this whole history of hypnosis being linked to things that people get scared of or things that people think, oh, it looks so flamboyant and so unreal, it can't be real and all that sort of stuff. That Michael Yapko's view is mindfulness hasn't had this long history of being slated. You don't have like, you know, the evil mindfulness person, you have evil hypnotist. So why not just do mindfulness instead? And um, so, yes, that kind of became uh, a lot of people have started kind of just ditching talking about hypnosis and they'll just focus on, they just, just do mindfulness based cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, A look. Yeah, a lot of thinking can take 20% of your energy up. So thinking is a good weight loss strategy. Let's have a look. Why would too many calories turn to muscle? That'd be weird. Yeah, laughing burns calories. Existing burns calories. Um, but yeah, dreaming is almost as being awake as being sort of uh, as active as being awake. Yeah, the whole you're unconscious thing obviously is an awkward one. I, I, when I met up with Adam Eason um, last summer, I think, maybe last June or whatever, um, we talked about this whole your unconscious thing, because obviously you do not have an unconscious mind. 
but you do have unconscious processes. So when you learn about social psychology, et cetera, um, you obviously learn about some of our automatic uh, unconscious behaviors, but you don't actually have an unconscious mind. Um, and yet, uh, and this is what I was talking to Adam about, there's that tendency that the words you're unconscious work really well as a direct command for someone to interpret as go inside and focus internally kind of thing uh, and do automatic behavior. So it kind of gives that message of do automatic behavior because you're saying, you know, you are unconscious and um, but you're talking kind of about that part, if that makes sense. Um, but it's not real. It's not like um, yeah, you're actually kind of referring to something that you know that you don't believe in, but you know that it's just a linguistic trick that you're doing because you know that most people will take it as something um, that helps them to deepen their state and become more internally absorbed. Um, and I was talking to Adam about how awkward I feel when I use it. Like I use it because it there are times when it works really well as a um, linguistic trick but it, it feels kind of awkward to do because you know you don't believe what you've just said in terms of an actual real thing. Um, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, mindfulness does seem to mean different things to different people. The difficulty is that mindfulness in terms of mindfulness is just being aware of uh, what's going on in the moment and being present. That's pretty much it. Yeah, you know, you're just being present. Um, but how you then broaden that out to what you're kind of doing with that mindfulness um, varies. You know, people use different techniques to help people to be present. They'll use techniques uh around things like focusing on um, breathing focusing on parts of their body focusing on a sound or whatever it happens to be um you know focusing on one word that they say or focusing on one thought that they have whatever it happens to be so that they're here and now present being mindful in the moment um and that is the whole point of hypnosis the whole point of hypnosis is to focus attention, to narrow that focus of attention to the here and now, to that thing that's important to be focused on. And in doing so, you increase responsiveness because once someone's focusing on just one thing, they get better at doing just that one thing. Um, yeah, at kind of responding to whatever it is they're focusing on. You become almost like engaged with what you're focusing on. Um, so the whole thing is kind of awkward because you think, how do you, all these terms are kind of awkward uh, and are better if you can avoid them. So nearly all the therapy that I would ever do, I wouldn't talk about hypnosis and I wouldn't talk about mindfulness. I would just be doing therapy. I wouldn't talk about any jargon because why should a client learn jargon or know about jargon? Um, what I would find is because people would think, but don't you do hypnosis? I want the hypnosis. I came here for hypnosis. That I would, I ended up falling into a pattern of at the end of a session, just for no reason other than to make the client happy. I would say, okay, now just take a moment to close your eyes and begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell you some things in the background. And I'm doing all that purely for no reason other than the fact that they want something that they can call hypnosis, that they feel like I came there for hypnosis, I got that hypnosis, even though there's no need for what I've just done no purpose to it other than so that they can think they got what they came for because I'd given them what they came for, which was the therapy. Uh, that bit was entirely just for their kind of belief of what they think they were supposed to get. Um, but before that kept on happening where people kept on saying, Oh, last session, you didn't do any of the hypnosis with me. That's what I really came for. And I really wanted, and I'll be thinking, well, the entire thing was hypnosis it's just that you're not a trained hypnotist. So you didn't know that or understand that. I never said, this is the hypnosis. Um, so you just end up having to do what you think is right. Um, 
for the person. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, we've got a dam in one of the stories. It, the thumbnail has a beaver, um, an otter, and a platypus on it. If anyone's in need of a dam. <laughs> no, we're not doing hypnosis now. Um, but yes, there are many things that people think of as hypnosis that I kind of that aren't hypnosis, um, they're kind of the image of hypnosis, like the swinging pocket watch. You know, people will come to you thinking that there's, you know, the swinging pocket watch is the hypnosis and they want the swinging pocket watch. Um, they will, you know, come along expecting you to kind of stick them to their chair or some weird other thing, you know, have it so their eyes don't open or, They'll say, I heard what you said, so I can't have been hypnotized. As if somehow you're genuinely going to knock them out. I always say that not hearing what I've said means you're probably dead or in serious need of medical attention. Um, so, you know, people have these views of what they think is hypnosis is and what the experience is going to be. Um, I've got to see what you said now so I can see what you're referring to. Um, well, if someone obviously there's a difference between jargon and knowing how something uh what things are and how they work you can talk about what things are and how they work without using jargon um but if someone wanted the jargon and it was likely to be therapeutically appropriate for them then obviously there's no harm in using the jargon um my experience with people is normally they want to get better and they don't even think about the fact you're not using jargon because they don't realize there is the jargon because they didn't, you know, it just doesn't even crop up. Um, Hopefully you're all caught up now. <laughs> yeah, coconut. That's what it should be called from now on. We have a big coconut issue. Um, but yeah, so I find it really interesting. People, what I find is that there are people who know about meditation who take offense to someone saying that it's like hypnosis in how it's done. Um, saying there is nothing like, because again, it comes down to, People who are meditating have different brainwave patterns. So this is as in like if you've got a Buddhist monk sitting in a, a room with you know someone scanning their brain compared to people who are actively doing hypnosis or you know sort of experiencing hypnosis because hypnosis is very much about focusing on one thing. Meditation you might have you, know, you often have a different if you're doing that kind of meditation a different 
kind of brainwave pattern. Where the, the issue comes is that when it's being used in a therapeutic kind of context, like linked with cognitive behavioral therapy or something, all of a sudden, what you're doing ends up being no different to how the hypnosis part, because the hypnosis is just focusing attention to help increase responsivity or responsiveness. And so when you just sort of, you know, look at that, all of a sudden it's like, so if the meditation is being used to help focus someone's attention and help them to be able to be more kind of in tune with themselves or whatever it happens to be, there's a therapeutic reason for it. It's not a kind of spiritual kind of reason or anything like that. It's being done specifically for a real world therapeutic kind of here and now, you know, to deal with anxiety, to deal with um, worry, to deal with whatever it happens to be. And that's, you know, my meditations, you know, imagine sticks on a stream is no different to where you would tell someone who says they worry and they attach to their worries to imagine sticks on a stream. Imagine the worries being like sticks on a stream. Um, and uh, yeah, I do have books specifically about the devil's work um, that I would get out when pestered by religious people who say it's all evil and bad. Um, I have books specifically named that. Um, but I also know there's, uh, I think it was David Kaloff. Um, I don't know if he does anything nowadays, but he used to be a hypnotherapy instructor who trained with Milton Erickson. And he talked in one of his lectures about having clients who would come to him saying, I'd love your therapy. I'd love to be helped by you. But because I'm religious, my church won't let me. And so he said, would they let me write you some prayers? Because you write out prayers that you can read at bedtime about, you know, what you'd like to how how you'd like things to go, etc. What you'd like to be improved in the future, all these sort of things. Would you let me do that for you? And then you can take those prayers um, to your church. They can read over the prayers. If they're happy for you to read those prayers at the foot of your bed, you know, kneeling down, read those prayers and then, uh, you know, close your eyes in a praying position and contemplate the prayer you've just read. Would you be OK with that? And the client says, yes, yes, I'm happy with that. They take it, uh, take the prayers um, to their church. They get checked over by the church. And as anyone would know, if you read half of what I've done uh, in different things, if you read it, you would see, actually, there's nothing written down here that I disagree with. There's nothing here that's like highly negatively manipulative, that's like spiritual in some kind of evil kind of way. And uh, so that, you know, the story that he told, he said that the client was then able to do the hypnosis, the self-hypnosis, but using those prayers essentially he would sit down or kneel down read the prayers close his eyes contemplate on what the prayer said and try and recall what the prayer said and that would be him doing self-hypnosis for himself but as far as he was concerned he was just reciting a prayer he'd been given to recite and as far as the church were concerned he was reciting a prayer that they had authorized and said is okay for him to read because there's nothing contained within it that they disagreed with it with and that that's what he was doing. Um, and so once you start kind of putting things into different uh, contexts, uh, Milton Erickson worked with someone where this guy was dying of cancer and was in agony. And so his family got Milton Erickson in and said, can you help him just to make these last bits uh, of his life more bearable for him with his family? And the man said, I don't want hypnosis. I'm, you know, hypnosis is evil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so Erickson said, look, what if I just do what I think will therapeutically help you? Um, I'm just going to talk about like uh, gardening and stuff. Uh, he said he found out the guy grew tomato plants and things. And so he did hypnosis by talking about tomato plants and how they were you know, planted in the soft soil and how they grew up. And he just told stories about tomato plants. And that obviously helped the guy, calmed him down, <clears throat> dealt with all his pain. And the guy was able to then um, 
uh, be comfortable while his family were around so that he could enjoy those last sort of few months without um, any pain, but without having accepted hypnosis as such. He'd just been told stories about farming and tomato plants. Um, Yeah, I've had that kind of uh, thing against me and I initially respond to things like that, normally thinking I probably shouldn't respond, but I feel that they need educating. And then, yeah, um, I fortunately normally just end up blocking them or I just ignore them. Um, it kind of depends how it pans out, whether it pans out with abuse or whatever. The same on YouTube. I get comments like that sometimes on videos on YouTube, and uh, and I used to get a lot more. Um, but depending on how it pans out, if they're not abusive, you know, if there's no actual abusive language, then I normally allow them to have had their free will, free speech, say what they want. I'll say my part. If they agree or disagree, that's up to them. But it's said, and I then ignore it and don't bother interacting again. Um, I've also had people who say, um, don't trust this guy, um, he's a con artist, um, you know, go to his website, it says he studied NLP, um, NLP is um, the biggest con going, um, and so you should never listen to this guy because if he does NLP, it means that He's not out to do scientific stuff. He's only out to con everyone and rip everyone off. And um, again, I tried to engage with that person for a while, but they kept on coming back aggressively. And then eventually I, I'd sort of been saying, is there a reason you're attacking me so aggressively? I'm literally saying I agree with what you're saying, that people should be science based. People should be uh, looking at evidence and research you only have to look at the stuff that I've presented you here to show that's exactly my approach to things. The fact that I've learned neuro-linguistic programming as part of my 20 odd years of doing this subject doesn't mean that I'm some kind of con artist. Um, and they just carried on being aggressive. And so eventually I just stopped answering them and eventually they stopped being aggressive uh, or stopped commenting. Um, but yeah, so I often, sort of either on websites or by email as well. I get it on email. Uh, and when I've been on the radio, I get like, I'll suddenly receive a letter in the post from someone that's like forwarded from the radio or from a newspaper or something from someone who's taken great offense because of my evil ways. Um, but yeah, so the first two hours or so of this were about autism, which is good. And then we, unfortunately got onto my hypnosis books um oh yeah that comes from up there uh the trouble with the topic of my hypnosis books is that i have hundreds and i can talk about them for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and i like showing off my hypnosis books because or else i just keep them to myself that's why i used to like teaching hypnosis at home I used to like uh, inviting students around to learn hypnosis here so that they would then have access in the lunch breaks and the morning and afternoon breaks to nose through my hypnosis library so that they could then see what sort of books I've got um, see if they liked certain ones that they might want I wouldn't lend them obviously I'm not stupid um, but they could then see what they might like to purchase for themselves um, and uh, it would kind of feel like, yeah, it's a bit like artwork that ends up being in a, uh, you know, locked in some kind of room somewhere that no one ever sees. And you think, what was the point in that artwork if no one ever um, got to see it, if it just remained locked up, that someone somewhere wealthy knows it's there, but no one ever sees it. So for me, I... Um, uh, quite like sort of showing off different books of mine and being able to talk about them and say, you know, this is this type of book and this is what I like about it, or this is really old, or this is about an unusual topic. Like, as I was talking about the other day, my um, book on Charles Dickens and mesmerism and stuff like that, things that 
even hypnotists don't necessarily know of certain books and they think oh i didn't even know there's a book out there on that uh, and there's pretty much a book on everything you can get books on like uh, reiki and hypnosis books on acupuncture and hypnosis books on you know you pretty much name a combination of things and you can get it so um Yeah, I again, there's been times where I've kind of ended up saying, right, here's my credentials or here's where I've been tra uh, trained, etc. But normally I just think, really, I've got no interest at all in any of that. Um, I don't think I have any particular passages in my books that I reread periodically. Um, I have certain books that I frequently end up turning to for bits of information um, because there are certain questions that regularly come up in conversations um, for example one of them is frequently people end up raising the question about saying you know hypnosis increases suggestibility so I frequently end up going back to the same kind of easy to find source that has the references that say that's not what the research shows and it's in the oxford handbook of hypnosis here is the easiest source for me to find because it's the first source that i read that in um and so i just happen to know that it's there so it's easier to find that than kind of go and try and uh, google it or something um so there are some books that i just know i can find that information I regularly have to find certain information. A bit like um, I watch, I don't know if anyone else does, uh, I watch the um, atheist, uh, who are they? I don't know, Matt Delahunty and the sort of atheist people. And frequently, Matt Delahunty will have to get out the chapter on slavery, uh, you know, the sort of bits on slavery in the Bible. And so you see him regularly, uh, like once someone calls in and starts talking to him, he'll instantly be flicking before they've even finished talking. He's flicking to the uh, the sections on slavery because he knows he's going to have to say them. So it's the same kind of thing with me, that there are just certain topics around hypnosis or certain things people say um, that make me instantly go to certain places to get the information about those bits um like for example the definition of what hypnosis is and things like that I, I go to the bits of information for that because they're commonly asked and i often find that people have um uh too much um i don't know there's a lot of training courses even for hypnotherapists there's a lot of training courses that teach completely wacky ideas like there's so many training courses that teach scientific hypnosis and then talk about hypnosis being the alpha state and all sorts of things like that that have no basis in fact. Um, but uh, so then you end up having to talk to other hypnotists saying, look, actually, and I've had I had one hypnotist who trained with me who um, as part of my diploma training, I would uh, I include six months of um, coaching to try and get your business off the ground etc followed by six months of clinical supervision because I'm assuming by then you're seeing clients and you'd need some clinical supervision as part of uh, making sure that you can stay registered as a hypnotherapist etc and it was kind of towards the end of the year after the training course that he said um, oh, a lot of what you taught me that I thought no that's not what others teach on their courses that's got to be rubbish he said I now realize isn't um, and so you frequently get that where you just find that there is stuff that um, uh, people don't kind of, they've been taught one way and that way has lots of flaws in it and doesn't match up with the research. And somehow a lot of training courses don't seem to consult researchers and scientists. Um, and I know that goes for lots of other subjects as well. Um, but yeah, if there's not any kind of lockdown on, obviously I'm often happy to meet up with people who want to nose at my books from time to time. Obviously, that's not an open invitation for me to have to see people all the time. But um, I 
<laughs> yes, books are better. Um, I went and stayed on Loch Ness looking for Nessie. I've probably done all three of those, seen Crown, Ju Crown Jewels, um, went searching for Nessie, and I've eaten crumpets. So uh, I'm back again tomorrow talking about something, loss, I think. Um, hopefully not loss of my books. No one's going to come in here and sneak them from behind me. In fact, it would take a ridiculously long time. Um, but yeah, so I'll be talking about loss tomorrow. Um, I do have some books that I know some of you would like that are the kind of topics that I've not touched on here. Like that's just a signed Darren Brown thing. Um, like the psychobiology of gene expression. That's probably one that I quite like turning to and I've got a book that is it this one yeah I bought this book the breakout heuristic again this is another psychobiology type neuroscience book and uh, um, I was asked I was told that I could return it or get money off and I said, no, I'm keeping this copy. I'm happy to have money off, but I'm keeping this copy. Um, so this is the book. Uh, and on the inside, if I just turn in a few pages. There's a flaw with the book. The inside is upside down and back to front. The reason I said I wanted to keep it, because there's nothing better than sitting in a cafe somewhere reading your book the correct way up with everyone thinking you're completely mad because they think you're reading it upside down. So, uh, um, obviously I decided to keep that book. Yeah. Gene expression fascinates me. Uh, that's probably my favorite type of subject to kind of, uh, look at and talk about and stuff. And I obviously have an entire shelf specifically on gene expression here in fact i have a shelf over there as well but this shelf is on um slightly more hypnosis related stuff but yeah um i'm capable of reading the psychobiology of gene expression book um but yeah so i've got lots of books on that topic on that shelf and on other shelves. Um, but it's now been three hours, 22 minutes that I've sat here joining you or you've sat here joining me one way or the other. Um, and I will be back tomorrow to talk about loss. And then obviously we'll progress. However, it progresses on from that. Yeah. I'll just read random books. I've talked about that before that, if it wasn't for the fact that I get copyrighted constantly, um, I would probably, you know, happily do something like that. I had someone the other day, I can't remember who it was, ask me if I would read, um, <laughs> yeah, asking me if I would read um, uh, Harry Potter or something. And obviously I said I can't do that for obvious copyright reasons, but that I do get hold of old books so any old book that's out of copyright like this one then i can read it because obviously um but i say i can read it. it does depend on the language and my reading ability um it's got fun pictures in it's like a little cat in a dress um yeah <laughs> um yeah so it's uh if it's an old book, like a hundred years or more old, then the chances are I can probably read it. But if it's a new book, then I can't read it because for obvious reasons, unless I had JK Rowling's permission, I can't read Harry Potter. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, you know, kind of irritating. Copyright can be irritating at times, but good at other times. So anyway, I will go now. 
and I will see those of you who come and join me tomorrow on here tomorrow at the same time, uh, 7.30. And then on Sunday, so tomorrow's Saturday, yeah. So on Sunday, um, Abby will be joining me. Abby will read some of the chapter on what it's like to be in a relationship with someone who's autistic. And then um, we'll discuss that as well for people. So anyone who's interested in that topic, join us on Sunday. And then Monday is back to normal storytelling at nighttime thing. So anyway, I will see you later. Thank you for joining me.